So I'm going to, uh, uh, this is Andy Steinberg, Chair of the uh, Finance Committee, and I'm calling the Finance Committee of May 7, 2021, to order at 1 p.m. And um, I apologize to everybody that we had a posting problem with what was scheduled to be yesterday's meeting. And I appreciate everyone's flexibility for being available today. I think that we have one more um, person to join us uh, from the Finance Committee, uh, and uh, that's Jane Scheffler. And she had uh, indicated to me that she is available today, so hopefully she'll be joining. But in any event, today's meeting uh, is a virtual meeting. Uh, it being held uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 18. And um, it, this is both a meeting of the Town Council and Finance Committee, and is noted being conducted by a remote participation. So, um, in accordance with the rules that we have regarding uh, the uh, virtual remote participation meetings, I'm going to ask each member of the committee to indicate that they can hear me and be heard by responding after I um, say their name. And uh, then um, I will turn it over to uh, Lynn, who is president of the council, she needs to call a council meeting to order and then confirm attendance of two additional councillors who are not members of the finance committee but are uh, participants in this joint meeting. Um, so I will start with um, Kathy Shane. I'm here. Bob Hagner. I'm here. Dorothy Pam. Yeah. Uh, Bernie Kubiak. Present. Um, so I think that, um, and Pat DeAngelis, sorry, Pat. Yeah, I'm here. So uh, uh, Lynn, when you uh, take over, that'll confirm your um, attendance and uh, that you can hear and be heard. So. Thank you. Um, I am present for finance committee as a finance committee member, but as chair of the council, uh, senior <laughs> form of the Amherst Town Council, I am calling a meeting of the Amherst Town Council together at 1.04 p.m. on May 7th, 2021. Uh, I want to check and make sure that Mandy Jo Haneke, you can hear us and we can hear you. Present. Wait, George Ryan. Present. And I just want to make sure that Mike and Doug can also hear us and we can hear them. Mike, yes? Yep, yep. Yes, I can. Thank you so much. Uh, I also just want to make, oh, and we have as well as Sean. Uh, I want to make sure that um, if Mandy Jo and George, either one of you decide to leave after a certain point in the presentation, you let us know that so that we can um, uh, adjourn the uh, town council meeting, but continue the finance committee meeting. Okay, thank you very much. George? Okay, so. Um, just a minute. I'm sorry, quick question. Um, do that through chat or just orally? I will have to card stop at yeah. about uh, at 2.30. So um, I just, I want me to send you a chat yeah. notice or what? I, I would raise your hand. That's the public way to do it. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Okay, so uh, today's meeting, uh, we're going to start first by uh, focusing on elementary schools. And then um, there are three sections of the uh, budget that we're going to talk about um, later. Uh, and one is uh, Senior Center Veteran Services and um, social services is on the list, though we are going to have a conversation about whether um, that's something we want to start today, but continue until another day, but I'll cover that later so we can get into the schools now. So, um, 
So I want to welcome um, and thank um, Superintendent Morris and Dr. Slaughter, the Finance Director for the Schools, for joining us today. And um, I don't know if either one of you wants to um, say anything sort of as a brief introductory overview, because uh, um, welcome to do that, please. So oh, thank you for having us. Um... You know, uh, speaking of hard stops, this meeting was originally scheduled. I was informed that it was supposed to be on Thursday and then uh, it shifted to Friday. As such, Allison McDonald, who's the chair of the Amherst School Committee is unable to attend given the shift. So she sends her apologies. I have a 145 that I can't change. Um, that wouldn't have been a problem, but it is. And that's not a fault thing. It's just the reality. Uh, so we will try to be as brief. We do have a brief presentation. We'll try to roll through that as quick as possible so we can get more to counselors questions. Uh, if that's okay with the uh, council and committee, I guess I should say. Yes. Um, so let me think this is going to work, but that's not what I wanted to project. So it's not going to work. Uh, let me try again. I see uh, elementary school FY22 budget presentation. Oh, you did. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm not a Zoom person. So. Uh, one of the last holdouts. So that I was seeing something else on my screen. So that is it. Thank you very much for letting me know, Kathy. So uh, again, we'll roll through these slides pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, starting from a place of our mission, which I think is really important to start with, uh, even if it takes a minute to talk about that we're really focusing on all learners and recognizing in a budget context that uh, to meet the educational needs of some students has different financial uh, aspects than uh, for other students. And we try to balance those two and try to provide a, a budget consistent with the finance committee guidance and the, uh, the guidance we received from the town of Amherst as best as we can. But there is some inherent conflict uh, that comes up uh, as we think about those things and we talk about it frequently. And, uh, and it comes up all the time at our hearings that we have at the school committee level uh, around the budget each year. Um, just a bit on the leadership team, uh, the Fort River principal, the search I think is just about coming to conclusion. I think next week we'll be able to announce the uh, incoming principal of Fort River because sadly for us, Diane Chamberlain are, has been principal there for the last four or five years, is becoming principal at a school in Thailand. So she'll have a fabulous experience there, um, but we're sad she's leaving. But uh, when we're in our boots and she's at the beach sometime in next December or January, <laughs> we will be very jealous of her, but she's done a fabulous job at Fort River. Uh, in a great number of ways. She's been the principal that was there as we integrated the Cominantes dual language program. Um, there's two specialized uh, special education programs at Fort River and her leadership will be sorely missed. Because these student demographics, um, after a period where they were shifting significantly, uh, haven't shifted as much over the last three or four years in Amherst. We've seen that shift play out at the region. But at this point, some of the shifts that we'd seen in the past are pretty are significantly stabilized, I would say, uh, for where we were. I will note that this year's demographics may be affected by students who may have chosen other options. We did see a significant decrease in students this year. We're actually seeing an increase now that students are back in person. So even our numbers from two months ago are no longer accurate for our enrollments. You'll see those later, but uh, we're seeing a significant number of homeschooled and uh, other families who made other options return to our schools now that our schools are open five days a week. Um, this is uh, something that you may have seen if you uh, were at the regional meeting, but one of the significant focuses, uh, actually, frankly, over the last 20 years, but we've just had a particular success with this over the last five, have been an increase in BIPOC or staff of color. And you can see that broken down by demographic group. And, and that really matters, representation matters. It matters for our students in a diverse school that they're seeing adults who look like them. Uh, and when we think about the uh, opportunity gap uh, or educational debt we owe our students, uh, this is something we're really proud of and, and um, have worked with the state and they see us as a model. I'm on the Racial Imbalance Advisory Committee, uh, which is a statewide group and having lots of conversations about what's, what's happened here and our work on that. So, you know, big appreciation of principals to Assistant Superintendent Doreen Cunningham for revising our hiring process completely uh, using some research and best practices to shift. Uh, how we approach things, and you can see the results uh, here in this document. So a couple of the initiatives we have going on, certainly we'll be thinking a lot about what this, you know, post-pandemic, which is probably optimistic language, but we'll, we'll go with it, uh, education looks like. Um, we have a lot of facilities needs. Uh, we've made a lot of facilities changes in our schools as a result of the pandemic. 
Uh, so we have a lot of space needs, particularly at two of our elementary schools at Fort River and at Wildwood, uh, as we've shifted how those spaces are used that aren't, it's not exact, there's no backseas on what we did. Uh, and for good reason, but we are gonna have to look at some adjustments over time. Um, this was talked about uh, even as last week at school committee will be a continuing conversation at the Amherst school committee level. Um, we know that there's been a significant shift uh, for students' well-being, um, and that's, some of that's around the pandemic, some of that's around uh, racial justice, and, and many other factors. So we are consistently focused on that. We received a grant this year that's supporting an increased focus on that. It was, a, I think, Doug can correct me, but I think an 80-ish thousand dollar grant where we're working with uh, River Valley uh, mental health consultants, and they're working with us both directly with students as well as advising us on strategies around that. So we appreciate to get the grant that doesn't come out of the taxpayers' pockets, but still supports that end. Uh, I just spoke about teacher to staff diversity and the grant we received is listed. And we are the last two weeks actually, both at the regional level and uh, coming up next week at the Amherst level, really going to explore the sixth grade question. So it's my 20th year in the district. Um, it's like cicadas, like every four or five years, the sixth grade question comes up. We are very atypical for having sixth grade students into the elementary school, less than 20% of schools in Massachusetts, as well as the country have a six, K to six, seven, eight, nine, 12 model. Uh, so we do intend the middle, the regional school committee last week, opened the door for elementary committees to start engaging on that question. We had a committed uh, citizen group that uh, worked on this and got sort of, the end got truncated because of the pandemic. Uh, so this is something that over the next couple of weeks and months, I think you'll begin to hear a lot more about. Um, and we're going to be interested to engage the community and see where they are on this question. Uh, there's going to be an intersection between the space needs and the sixth grade question, as well as potentially the building project. So uh, there's a lot of, um, I use this term a lot, a lot of Venn diagrams where there's a sixth grade question and a space question and a building project. And all those things have things in the middle and they have each unique aspects to each of them. And, and that's the, the complex matrix that we're gonna be talking a lot, of, a lot about and engaging the community on in the next couple months and, and go moving forward. Um, I'm gonna turn it to Doug, who's again, conscious of time here because we do wanna get to counselors questions, but just um, you know, maybe just, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I wasn't a good model, Doug, my apologies. But uh, if you could just go over very briefly uh, the next couple of slides and we'll open it up for the counselors and the committee. Absolutely. So <clears throat> based on this slide, we're talking about sort of where our budget is going this coming year. Um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're asking for uh, about a 2% increase, which meets the, with the guidance uh, from the town as far as what it's uh, available to do. Uh, that requires us to, uh, to reduce from a level services budget by a little bit in order to make that happen. Um, <clears throat> and so the ask for this coming year is, is going to be uh, $24,300,000. $86,522. That's not on the slide, but that is the relevant number. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, please. Um, and so this is, you know, sort of the, the quick snapshot of where do we spend our money? It's mostly on people. Um, and it's, it's a people business. Uh, government generally is, and especially schools. Um, we, you know, we do have expensive things, you know, buildings are expensive to have, but, but we, but people are a lot more expensive between uh, what it costs to pay them as well as their benefits. Uh, we have a pretty significant uh, amount of our budget dedicated to that. And as those, as those needs for kids change, it changes who we have to have and who we need to have in place and, and those costs shift accordingly. Um, so this, this slide is just uh, laying out a little bit of where we spend our, our money on, on staffing. Um, but you see that regular ed, special ed, by and large, you know, the number of students in those groups is, is significantly different, but the, the amount of people and the costs associated are, are very similar. Uh, and I, I would suggest that's probably not atypical across uh, other districts in the, in the Commonwealth. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so in our regular education instruction, you know, half of it goes to classroom instruction. Um, and, and that's where, where we spend the lion's share of our money uh, in, in that regard. Uh, and then we have smaller amounts for the more speci specialized things. Uh, we do call it kindergarten. Uh, I always find that interesting, but I think it's a bit of an artifact of, of Kindergarten not being compulsory even to this day. Uh, if you're if you're under age six, you're not compelled by law to be in, in school. Uh, but that's a quirk of things. Uh, but you'll notice ELL is a pretty significant chunk, the 14%. That's that's a pretty uh, sizable chunk of, of spending that we need to do uh, to support those kids that English isn't their first language. Um, uh, and and again in this in this area, uh, one thing that it's not easy to see here, nor is it in the other um, in the other uh, 
uh, longer line by line document that we have is where we utilize our school choice funding. I will say that does impact, and we'll get into the specifics of that a little bit later. It does impact uh, these these numbers, but not so much the the uh, uh, the effort that we make for 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 those uh, regular education students. Um, next slide, please. So in special education, um, we try to keep a fair amount of of our special education students in district, and so we offer a number of programs in that regard to. Uh, meet those kids' needs and, and uh, keep them placed within our schools. We think that's uh, better uh, educationally. We think it's better uh, for our non-special education students uh, to, to be in and a part of, of the school with those kids. Uh, and, and we think it's a cost-effective strategy as well. Uh, but as you see here, you know, the, the breakdown of, of, of how we are uh, delivering those services. What you'll see in the, in the graph, the left, is a pretty strong uptick over the last, you know, few years in our spending in, in special education. Uh, and that's driven by the needs of the students that we're experiencing. If you've seen uh, uh, Dr. Brady, our special education director in, in various meetings, she's talked about at the elementary school the, that some of the students that we have currently have a much higher level of need and that requires more resources to, uh, to meet that need. Um, Okay, if I could just pause, uh, just one, one comment I want to make. Um, the preschool we have at Crocker Farm, which is a significant 12% of the special ed spending, um, I think just it, I think it's worth the 30 seconds to say that that is a state defined program around special education. We do accept typical peers or regular education preschool students, um, but uh, and we charge a, a relatively nominal fee as compared to private preschools in the area. Um, but it comes out because that's our obligation. When students turn three and they have special needs, uh, every community in the Commonwealth is mandated to do that, is to have a, a to support those students and their special needs uh, from ages three to kindergarten. And so I think it's just worth noting, you see that at special ed preschool. Some of you may know that there are non-special education students there, but it does fall under the preschool bailiwick because that's, that's how the structure of uh, public preschools are set up in Massachusetts. Sorry, Doug, I just, I know that one. I often get questions about that. Thank you for that. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> These are the other support services that we provide. It's, you know, it, it, um, you know, much smaller part of the budget, but it's a variety of ways in which we, we try to support our staff through professional development, uh, keep our libraries working, health services. Obviously, that's, a, that's an area this year that we've all been uh, noticing a lot more of because we've had to, to uh, spend a lot more time thinking about our, our health and our community health and that sort of thing. Um, but these are the areas that fall outside of, of what you think of as classic instruction and uh, other ways we support students and, and our staff in order to, to, uh, to achieve our goals. Um, next slide, please. So here's yeah, I, a list of uh, ads and cuts. Ed. Yep, and I can take this one. So we do have declining enrollment. We're anticipating one fewer, uh, a need for one fewer classroom teacher in the district. Uh, special ed teacher, we did do an ad when Comandantes came in to make sure that we were covered in terms of bilingual special education needs. We said at the time it's a temporary need because as the program matures, uh, we would have the same number of special educators as all the other schools. It was just at the beginning, we only had kindergarteners and you had special needs and it needed to be delivered bilingually. We needed a temporary ad and we try to be consistent. When we say it's a temporary ad, it's really a temporary ad. Now that Comandantes will be K to two, uh, we're able to reduce uh, a position and still maintain our services of student needs. So um, the below is the specials. So uh, with declining enrollment and all these are difficult cuts, I wanna say. But with declining enrollment, uh, we are able to ensure that students have all of their specials uh, at the same amount of time they currently have them. It will have an impact uh, somewhat on the integration uh, parts of the day, but none of this will, none of, this reduction won't reduce uh, the instructional block for specials and art, um, but it does reduce the integration time in those two areas. Um, at the facilities, I think we spoke about that at the regional level and the food service, some of the central office cuts, uh, we've talked about multiple places, the bilingual psychologist, again, to clarify, this is not a direct service position. This is about literally who does evaluations when there are bilingual students who are being tested for special education. Uh, we've had the position posted for a year and a half. We haven't had any suitable applicants. Uh, we will save money by contracting this out, but I know this is one that's been a little bit confused perhaps. Uh, I haven't done a good job clarifying that piece. This is not a reduction in services at all. Um, reception position at central office and our ELL program report indicated that we had more interpreters than was you know, perhaps beneficial or compared to other comparable districts. So uh, again, difficult reduction, but we wanna be fiscally conscious. And when we have experts in the field tell us um, 
actually, you know, what best practice is and we're doing something a little different, uh, we, we make those reductions. Uh, I didn't talk about there was no sabbatical request and we're anticipating some turnover savers over turnover savings, which is when people retire, we generally hire people. And we've been really good about that the last couple of years and put an emphasis on hiring people um, that can replace them who are highly talented and have long careers ahead of them. And that also um, is positive for our budget. So those were the level service pieces. And I think because it's 120 and I have a 145, I'm going to stop there because I feel I'm afraid otherwise we'll do all the talking and not allow for the other folks to ask questions, if that's okay with the, with you, Lynn. So um, thank you for the initial presentation. I'm going to um, just say one thing. I, well, actually, do have, Jane Scheffler has joined us. And uh, Jane, I'm going to just confirm that you can hear us and we can hear you. And... I'm here. Okay, great. Sorry Thank for you. the delay. <laughs> um, no, that's okay. Uh, so the uh, couple of reminders, and then I'm going to uh, try and get into questions really um, quickly because we are limited in time with uh, uh, Superintendent Morris present. Um, as we talk about the budget, um, I think that we're um, that the, the, the budget we're looking at right now is the budget that is part of what is from the town budget. And um, it is, uh, so it matches what was in the budget guidelines that were passed by the council that started the process. The, um, the funds that might be available from federal sources for um, because of the pandemic, both the ESSER funds and American Recovery Act funds um, is a separate pot of money and um, we can ask questions about it, but I just wanted to make sure that we're all clear that the budget as presented does not include any of those funds. Uh, Doug, uh, right on that or? I, that is correct. Yeah, so I just wanted, and the other thing that I wanted to point out as far as the appropriation from um, that's from the town, that the council, uh, we have a, this is, um, that budget is incorporated in the town manager's budget and the council can add, <clears throat> cannot add to it. It can only um, confirm it or subtract money from any budget. Uh, and that's a matter both of uh, what's in the charter and uh, Mass General Law chapter 44, section 32. Uh, so that um, we have to just want to remind ourselves of that. And uh, I think that those were the uh, two introductory things I wanted to say. And I guess the other point is, is that, um, you know, we want to understand the budget, but, you know, it is the school committee's budget uh, that is being presented to us. So um, with that, I wanna open it up to questions and uh, I'm gonna uh, ask that people try and focus on questions that they think are really important to ask while the superintendent is present because uh, um, he does have a hard stop that he's informed us about. And uh, then I will uh, go from, um, Maybe uh, Doug can stay a little bit longer if the conversation continues. So please focus on questions you think that really need, uh, are best to ask while the superintendent is still with us. Um, I had seen a couple of hands up earlier, and um, one was Mandy. I do you did. Yeah, um. I just wanted to clarify what you just said about budgets because section thirty two of chapter. 44 of the MGL actually does have a way to raise school budgets, but it requires the cooperation of the school committee. And at this point, the school committee has not requested an increase in that budget. So it's it's a little more complicated than just no. So I just wanted to make that clarification. Um, yeah, well, we should talk about that uh, later because I was, I'm not clear about that because uh, it has to do with regional schools. It, it, the mention, I think in section of, when, as I recall, it mentions regional schools, not local schools. 
it, it mentions both, but we can talk about that later when the okay. superintendent. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kathy, what, um, what, but um, again, please try and start with questions that you really think are important to ask while uh, uh, Superintendent Morris is here. Okay, um, I sent some of these in, but not very much in advance. So I apologize. And Lynn, I know had sent some in and she said some of mine overlapped, but um, you already mentioned I'll just focus on the bigger items than I know. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking in particular for, is there any way to come back and uh, revisit a couple of decisions that were being made, but I'll wait on that. So my, my first question is on special education. I did a four year rate of increase. So I took 2022 over 2018 for each of several items and special that whole expenditure on payroll is up about 15% compared to 3% for regular. Um, so I think Mike, what you said is that is, so my question is that more kids in that category and or more seriously high needs kids. And then my third part to this question is, you know, is, is Amherst disproportionately there and uh, compared to Northampton region? surrounding schools and could the state help us out? So if we went and looked at where the circuit breaker threshold is on where the state comes in. So is there, are there issues, and I'll ask this about charter secondly, but issues we should be raising to man, the Mandy and, Mindy and Joe level that would help any district that wants to make sure they're doing well by special needs kids, as you said, you know, pr providing what the kids needs. If they become a magnet for, for, for children because of the reputation and get high need kids as a result of that, that the state circuit breaker could help. So it's that three part, it's disproportionate compared to regular. And I'm worried that the end result, well, you're watch, looking at every day, is squeezing out the breadth of other programs we can offer because we, you have to live within this restricted budget. So I'll stop with that as my first question. Sure, I can, I can start and, and I'll ask Doug maybe to do a little bit on Circuit Breaker. Um, he'll do better than I will at that. But I think what you're seeing is, an, what you're saying is an accurate reflection. We are seeing more students who come in with uh, not just special learning needs uh, or learning needs, but health needs. So the number of students we have who, whose IEPs from when they turn three require a nurse assistant to be with them um, to access the curriculum, um, it's higher than what we've seen, right? And, and our preschool staff have been noting this for a number of years that they're seeing more and more students with more significant needs. I think Faye Brady's, I know it's a public meeting, she said it before in a public meeting, it's, you know, she's not trying to advertise how good a job we do at special ed, we just do it. But I, you know, bluntly, there's a reality to that. And, you know, special education parents have networks and communicate about districts that are supporting their children uh, at high level, and not just public schools, all schools, uh, I don't want to just make it a, a, about public schools. And, and, you know, for better or worse, and, and I think it's, you know, better for kids and, and perhaps worse fiscally, we do have a reputation of working collaboratively with families to provide the resources that um, they need to be successful. And so this is a desirable community that way. Uh, we have a lot of internal programs that's atypical, especially in Hampshire and Franklin County. So if you want, if you have a student with intensive needs and you don't want to send them out to a day program, there's not many school districts that have first of all, that are large enough, frankly, and this isn't a critique of, I mean, if you're in Hadley, uh, I know the superintendent there really well. It's a wonderful school district. There's not, a, there's, it's a, such a small district. There's not going to be enough students with similar needs to create a program. In our situation, that's a little bit different. We do have the capacity that way. So it is something we're aware of. It's something we talk about frequently. Dr. Brady's actually having some of those conversations, our special ed director with principals right now. Uh, we also have a community that requests, because um, with special education requests, it can come from a family, it can come from the school, and we have a very active community. And that's a great thing. And, uh, but it, it also means compared to some of our, our neighboring districts, um, parents rightfully advocate for the services that their children need. And, and we try to collaborate when we can. Uh, it's not to say that every family would say that their needs 
uh, child's needs are fully met in the district with special needs. I, I, we have data to show that that's not the case. Um, but the cost piece of it is is real, and we are it's it is a concern that we have, um, and it's still the students who are in front of us, right? And and taking care of the needs has to be the highest priority. But Doug can speak a bit about circuit breaker and how that works, which is a partial reimbursement. It doesn't fully reimburse the cost, but it is somewhat helpful um, fiscally for us. Right. So uh, generally speaking, the way it works is the the uh, the legislature will fund a circuit with you know circuit breaker at a certain level, and what that hap what happens is this is that in order to uh, qualify for that type of reimbursement, first off, your your expenses for a given job will have to be four times a base rate. So they have a sort of per pupil base rate. It's in the twelve to thirteen thousand dollar range. Your overall expenses have to exceed four times that number before you can even ask for a reimbursement. Then once you get above that threshold then they reimburse at a particular percentage of. So it's not 100% once you get above that, it's a, it's a percentage of that. Um, and that's about you know what that percentage is is based on what the funding looks like uh, at the state level. So if they fund the circuit breaker you know, large, you know, to a greater extent, that percentage goes up and we get uh, more support for us in that regard. And so uh, it's, a, it's a pretty high bar. I mean, to get to four times the, the sort of base level of cost is, is in the order of 45 to $50,000. Um, that's a that's a pretty expensive uh, amount of work and and support we're giving a kid, um, uh, but nonetheless we have some students that qualify in that area and and we we definitely uh, leverage the option to uh, to seek that funding. So just to on the legislative end, then I know that's what's in the law now. So if we were we, meaning the larger we of the town or we the you, <laughs> uh, were to say what would happen if we lowered it to three times and or increase the percentage? Um, how many districts would benefit that? What would be the benefit to Amherst? You know, have we done either, not recently, have we ever done that kind of analysis and, and or provided it then to our two legislative leaders? Yeah, I can jump in a little bit, which is to say that this is part of the um, Student Opportunity Act and some of the work was, um, Circuit Breaker was a, a honestly a highly charged item um, because it benefits all districts. And the idea of the Student Opportunity Act was primarily to uh, equal out disparities in funding between uh, districts that do spend, have a high per, per people cost because they have a tax base um, that can, um, support that or is willing to support that versus more urban districts uh, that don't have that. So, um, you know, but it certainly would help an awful lot. It would also help if Circuit Breaker was fully funded. But the big thing that I would answer, ask your question, though it's a bigger ask. So there's the IDEA funding, which is the federal special education funding, uh, which when IDEA, I'm guessing 60s, 70s, I think it was early 70s when IDEA was passed, um, they're nowhere close to funding their original commitment. On IDEA, so you know, it, it actually, if we're real serious, we collectively are real serious about special education costs. I actually don't think the state is necessarily; uh, it's the most convenient place, right? We know the legislators personally, all those things, but um, at the federal level, they're wildly underfunding their commitment to special education, and um, you know, I think they're funding it. I'm a little nervous saying in a public meeting, but it's well under half. That I feel comfortable saying. Uh, that the federal government's commitments in IDA are be, being they're never close to funding even half of what the original commitment was. Okay, thank you. No, that's helpful. So there's a you're suggesting that if we do a ledger, if we do a, a focus, it might better or be both levels, but definitely should not forget the federal level. Um, yeah, that's it's really the only thing they fund um, for the most part uh, in substantive ways. Uh, you know, most of the state funding comes from local or the state in terms of public schools. So special ed is the one piece where the federal uh, has a pretty large impact. There's other grants that they do like Title I, but IDA is a big special education funding source uh, for districts. I don't want to take up too much of the time, Andy, but the other question I had is similar to this on charter. When um, a, a should I ask that? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So should I just give everyone else a chance to ask a question, Lynn? I'd also just like several people have questions on special ed rather than jump around i'd like sure. to special ed so sure uh, I, I'll, I'll come back i'll come back later so uh, bernie was your question about special ed yeah it was uh, on circuit breaker specifically and i i just wanted uh 
<clears throat> one of the good doctors to refresh my memory is that my memory of the circuit breaker is it's it's retroactive. So you have to put up 100% of your costs. And then at some point in the future, the state will reimburse you whatever they figure out your your, your, your due under the circuit breaker. So you're looking at um, getting money back in the following fiscal year frequently. That's correct. There is a lag of, of basically a year. So the expenses we submit from this year would be paid to us next year. Um, they do have, if you have an extraordinarily uh, expensive placement that comes in to mid-year, a kid moves to town that has an extraordinarily uh, expensive placement. They do have a, an option that allows you to get immediate relief, um, but by and large, yes, it's a year lag. Thanks. Anything else uh, people want to raise? Uh, Lynn? Uh, in looking at the, the first page of the detail budget and then also page 38th, I see a rise in costs in special ed, but a decrease in staff. Am I reading that correctly? You, oh, uh, Doug, uh, you want to take this one? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's, there's one piece that you should know generally about. So that list of, of additions and reductions that we have, those have not been applied in the detail part of the budget. They're only, they're still in a lump sum, uh, sort of at the, at the bottom right before the grand total. Um, and so the, the, the salary lines that would be associated in special education are uh, still reflecting the, the, the values that are in, the, in that reductions list. So that, that increase would be uh, reduced by uh, you know, the, the amount of, on that, which I think is about $95,000. So that, that year over year change of 200 and some odd thousand would, would reduce by about 95,000 with the proposed reductions. Um, and then the other changes in those costs are, are relative to uh, the staff that we have and, and the needs the students have relative to the staffing that we, we're projecting there. Right, but, but, so, but when I look then at page 38, included in the um, $372,000 worth of cuts uh, seems to be one special ed teacher and one bilingual psychologist. I think you already explained that one earlier that, you know, it's, um, but it, so we're seeing an increase in costs, but yet we're reducing staff. Am I getting that right? You are, um, you know, some of it has to do with, with uh, the, the steps that, that staff get. Um, we're just in a general, and this is a broad general sort of statement about uh, all of the staff we have. We're younger than we used to be. When I first started working for the district about, I think it was about 75% of the staff were at the very top step. Uh, right now, we're in the between like 50 and 60 percent of the staff are, are at the top step, which means, you know, the other half essentially are going to get a step. Step increases for an individual roughly in the 4 percent range, which puts a lot more pressure uh, on the budget in, in, you know, in a year over year uh, basis. Um, and then additionally, I think, you know, as, as we talked about the needs of the students, uh, sometimes the FTEs don't change as much, but who does the work does. So if, it, you know, if a paraeducator can do the support a student and that student moves to the middle school and then the kid that comes in that might have a special need now needs someone with with a higher level of, of sophistication in their training uh, than that person the FTE might not change but the but the cost does because the person's more expensive to hire. Thank you. Okay, um, Mandy, do you, it's your question on special ed? Yeah, it's a follow up to Lynn's. Um, the expense account I think she was referencing too on page one shows a special ed increase of 250 plus thousand dollars. Um, you know, it's it's really other than personnel payroll, the only increase in the budget, significant increase in the budget, there's others. Um, and so what is accounting, I think she asked this earlier, but in, in pre-meeting questions, but what is causing that significant increase there? And is that something that will maintain an increase year over year now in terms of either that leveling out at the 400 total, um, or is it going to be still going up 200 and some K a year after FY22? I'm gonna take this one, Doug, or you wanna do it? Go ahead. Okay. So uh, we have uh, historically, for most of the years I've been doing this, we've had uh, less than two out of district placements at the elementary level. So uh, when we feel like we can't meet the educational needs of students, um, 
then, you know, we, you know, meet with the team, including the family and figure out the best educational environment. We've had an increase in students whose needs we can't meet in our, um, despite our special ed program. So that, that expense is really about tuitions. So we wouldn't expect that line to increase unless there were more students who come in that level of needs, which we don't have information is the case. The students we have, we have had some intensive needs students come in, but they fit well within our current programming structure. But uh, we, we've seen an increase and that's really atypical for us at the elementary level to have students uh, at a district. As I said, most there's been plenty of years we've had zero at the elementary level. And, and frankly, we pride ourselves on that, that our programs are uh, supported well enough to be able to, um, that broad range of students that we have, um, but we've had students that, that we, at team meetings, they came to an agreement that we, we weren't the right program to meet the educational needs of that student. So it is a repeating cost. So I wanna be clear about that to your question, but it's not necessarily an escalating cost. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Um, so, Kathy, you're the only one that right now with your hand up. But, um, remember to please focus uh, as you pick questions on ones you think are important for Dr. Morris and because he has to leave in a couple of minutes. And I do have one question that I at least want to pop out. So, but go ahead, Kathy, if you have something. Okay, as I said, I didn't want to um, dominate this. So if other people have questions, I mean, my question on charter was similar to the circuit breaker and I can do it later, but it's, it's I wonder when we have a child, I don't know how many kids are leaving for charter schools from elementary and do they bring the average higher amount that we're spending compared to other towns and does that include the special needs kids in that average higher and so where i'm going is a change in formula and a change its way it's calculated um do we have that analysis and are we providing that at the boston level so it's i know it's nothing you can do about but i just don't have a sense of how much um it affects the budget i didn't see anything that talked about charter leaving and the cost to us. Yeah, so I can, I can answer that, I think. Um, and Sean, may, I may do a throwback call to Sean because uh, we worked on this a couple of years ago uh, in his old role. Um, but the short story is lots of unfair things about the charter formula. One of, we're seeing pretty flat attendance, you know, or, or students going out, we're not seeing an increase that way. Um, but you're absolutely right that because we um, support our special ed students, that does increase our per people allotment, which then influences how much money charter schools gain by students from Amherst going attending them. So, you know, uh, there's other factors like school choice and that factors in. So there's a lot of um, just very bluntly, the charter schools in our area, and I'm not, this isn't a critique, but they don't have specialized programs the way we do, right? Their size isn't there. It's not like a broad, right? I get a lot of virtual tomatoes thrown at me for a lot of things about charter schools. This is not a dig at charter schools. It's a dig at the formula that includes intensive needs students in a formula. And those schools aren't, you know, in general, programming for intensive needs students, which I find broadly unfair, as well as out of district students. So, you know, we could have out of district students that are six digits, you know, one student, uh, the tuition based on the student's needs may be in the six digits. That gets factored into our cost, but it also gets factored into a formula that has nothing to do with the students who are attending charter schools. So that, because I have to leave in a second because I have a DESE conference call, I'm happy to talk offline, but Sean has also done a lot of work a couple of years ago and we both have the scars to prove it in terms of um, some discussions about this that uh, some people like, some people um, don't like. But in terms, in general, we have fewer special education students going out for charter schools, uh, particularly as it relates to intensive special needs students. Um, so we have data on that. Our charter school exodus rate, you know, out rate is, is pretty constant, you know, the last three, four years, uh, three years, I would say it's gone down one year, it's been pretty flat. So we're not seeing an increase, we're not seeing a decrease. We, we do, you know, that money that we charter choice uh, does come out of the budget from the town. So, you know, some other communities, and I'm not advocating for this, like Belchertown, the money from charter, those costs are borne by the town, not directly by the district. That's not how we do it here in Amherst. I'm not complaining, I'm not advocating, but it, different towns allocate the charter school cost differently. And so one of the things when you think about per pupil cost, and that's why it's such a funny number is it's, it's, you know, we have this dance about, well, we reimburse the town for the year before, other towns don't organize things that way. 
So it's, it's a longer conversation than probably we have capacity or time for now, but one I'd be happy to engage in. And I'll answer, because I do have Desi texting me because I got to be on a conference call with them right now, ironically. But one other question you asked that I can answer, uh, you emailed Kathy, is about Wildwood's utility costs being greater than Fort Rivers utility costs. Uh, and shockingly, I know the answer to that one because I don't do well on utilities, but uh, Wildwood is uh, oil heat and Fort River was updated, I would say somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 years ago uh, to gas heat. We had plans to look at that for Wildwood. There was the moratorium because uh, the building I'm in right now at the middle school, you know, is across the field from Wildwood and is on gas. Um, when we met and the moratorium happened and that's where we are. But um, that's why there's a cost difference is that in general, oil is more expensive than, than gas. And I leave you in the very capable hands of Dr. Slaughter. Again, I apologize with the date change. I couldn't change this other meeting. It wasn't, you know, Desi calls, I gotta do what they gotta tell me, right? Oh, well, thank you. I'm sorry about that. Um, the other question I was gonna ask, just so you know, and I, cause you can, uh, if Doug can't answer it, you can take it up in another format. And that is whether you've thought about the process for allocating ESSER and uh, Recovery Act funds that are available to the schools and what they might be used for any of the budget reductions if possible, uh, if that was something you were thinking about. But um, I'll leave it to Doug if he can answer it. And if not, we'll take it up in a later yeah. format. I'll give you my 30 second and Doug will do uh, more. But on ESSER 3, which is the most recent stimulus, we don't have, uh, and Desi sent an email to this fact, we don't have the actual amount, uh, nor do we have specifics on intended use. Uh, or allowable uses. It says it's loosely like the other ones, except you have this and this and that. So we're still waiting is a short story on ESSER 3. Uh, it's a multi-year grant. Um, so uh, at this point, we're still in a holding zone, but I've talked to Paul and Sean who have been fabulous throughout this process. But Doug and I about, you know, both the municipal and the school. And once we get more clarity, having conversations about what that would look like going forward. But I will leave you in Dr. Slaughter's capable hands. Again, I apologize to have to leave. Uh, earlier than intended with the date change, but I hope you all have a lovely weekend and those of you mothers have a wonderful Mother's Day this weekend. Thank you. So, um, Lynn, I'll see what, if you have something that yeah. I, uh, I, I just want to make a, a request that creates an equal playing field and that is as much as uh, Superintendent Mars is always so willing to do stuff offline it's really not appropriate that questions get asked to him and then not shared in terms of answers with everyone. So um, if we feel we need to bring somebody back or we feel we need to create a set of questions, I think that's great, but um, the offline isn't really, doesn't create the level playing field of knowledge. Thank you. No, I think that that's a good point. And, uh... I uh, raised the question that I raised because I thought it was of general interest and uh, that we would, as a committee, um, want to know the answer to, but um, it certainly should not be, uh, I, I agree with what you said about everything should be done for the benefit of the entire committee and not offline. Um, so, uh, Kathy? Did you, you had other questions that had been posed in advance and Doug might have answers to. Okay, I, I, I have one more. Um, the um, central, I, I literally did what I think is a sort of a simplistic way of looking at things. And I went to the four year increase and everything, anything that was not in the same per year. So central administration um, compared to school administration goes up much faster uh, again um, in, as a rate of increase over that four years. And I don't, uh, my, my bigger question is, what is the total central administration cost? And it, can we see that somewhere? Because you allocate that then down to regional and to elementary, as I understand it, right? You know, so central administration has to be priced out somewhere. So I didn't know whether maybe this was the allocation changed, you know, that more of it was going to elementary than had gone before, or um, whether it's a staffing that someone moved out of school administration up to central, but it was enough of a difference. So one went up by 17% and the other went up by under two over the four years. So I wasn't looking at tiny differences. Um, so that was my, my other 
overarching question when I just looked at change over time. Right. So I'll start with the first question first, which was around how we apportion those costs between the different th the three different districts that we work with here. Um, we really haven't changed that uh, significantly over the last a couple of years. Uh, so that's that's not probably much of a driver in that regard. There may be individuals that the apportionment between districts has changed a little bit. I think that's likely a bit of a cause there. I think there's also some, there's been some, um, uh, I don't want to necessarily say central office additions. There's, there have been some some work uh, and some positions in the central that are now being essentially charged to the central office um, that had been, uh, you know, if you go far enough back, we're in there and then kind of moved out into either uh, regular education or in school level uh, educational costs and then come back. So like uh, our curriculum director's cost is one that's come on in the last couple of years. Uh, we've had curriculum directors and, and people in those roles over the over the uh, intervening years, but it, at times it's been uh, you know shared out into the school administration and now it's more centralized. Um, we've also um, the staffing that uh, supports the the uh, the central offices around uh, communication and, and clerical and administrative support that kind of thing has had some changes in the last couple of years, um, and so that's probably also that that not probably that is a little bit of it as well. It's not a huge piece, but um, you know it did it did bring some people into that central office staffing uh, area that that would have caused that increase as well. Um, as far as the school administration costs, um, you know that. That has stayed fairly flat because we've got, uh, you know, we've had three buildings with a principal and assistant principal and their clerical staff, and that's all stayed pretty much the same. So what you're seeing there is, is, uh, is, is pretty uh, unchanged over the last several years. So the, the increases there are relative to people's uh, steps and colas. Okay, uh, Lynn. Thanks, Doug. Um, I've I actually, I also asked a question about facilities and even since I've asked it, uh, something that was said today uh, sparks me to, uh, to push a little more. And that is that I know that we were able to make some serious accommodations uh, for in, in both Fort River and Wildwood. But now that we have students coming back in more in greater numbers, what in fact are we doing about our facilities that allows us to still abide by the state guidelines um, for COVID. And I know that you have an increased amount here in facilities under expenses, uh, which is what my original question was, but it does seem to me that we've got two schools that, well, I'm actually, we have three elementary schools that I'm not clear how you can do desks at part at whatever level they're supposed to be in you know, still have kids not sitting on windowsills. So. so I'll be able to answer that to some degree, not probably to the fullest amount that the superintendent certainly could, but but I'll certainly answer some of that. So <clears throat> I'll start with your original question, which was relative to sort of the coming year's budget. Um, there are a few you know, pressure points on on that uh, facilities area. And, and so in that facilities area and expenses have our utilities. And so uh, you know, when you guys raise the water and sewer rates, that's an expense that gets passed on to us. Uh, our electric bills go up. I mean, I'm not going to blame you guys for, I mean, the need to do that was, was necessary and as necessary. So, you know, I've sat in the uh, select board chair and voted for those uh, increases in other years. So I, I do appreciate the, the need there, but it does have that impact on us a little bit. Um, those are small. They're not huge dollar amounts, but they do contribute to that. Um, you know, the, the uh, anticipation of, of uh, fuel costs for the coming year is, is another one. Um, and so those those are the ones I can think of off, off the top of my head that that are starting to impact that facilities use the the increases in uh, well not transportation it's held separate there um, so those are those are the primary ones I would say there in and in general talking about sort of the space question uh, you know it is it is real it is a it is a complicated one fortunately at this point in time for this year. Um, uh, you know as we bring the kids back you know we're still at a at much lower numbers uh, you know. Kids had the option to remain in remote, and so we didn't. I think about seventy-five percent uh, decided to return it in person. So that's one piece that's kept the current circumstance such that we can fit within the spaces we have. Um, but I think also as we go into next year, the utilization of space is going to be very different, especially in Fort River and and uh, and uh, uh, Wildwood. 
uh, by virtue of the modifications we made. Uh, we're going to leverage spaces like cafeteria spaces uh, differently. Um, I'm sure we're going to use outdoor uh, uh, spaces much more often. Um, uh, we are, you know, continuing to plan and, and think about that. I think the other thing that's that's a, a really open question for us, and and this gets to I think one you had sent us, is uh, enrollment. I think that's such an open question for us this coming year. Um, you know, uh, we've you know the drop from last year to this year was pretty significant uh, in in the order of four to five percent. That's a much much larger drop than than it, than it would normally be the case. We expect a fair number of those students to come back, but exactly who will or who won't, uh, and how much, and is is very dependent upon uh, very individual decisions. We just don't know. So you know, we're kind of planning on uh, about the same number of students we have this year. There, it probably will be a little larger than that, um, but you know, we'll we'll be spending our our time and are already spending time. Uh, Thinking about those spaces and how to activate those, and and we're doing some more work in in regard to air quality in some spaces so that we can leverage more of those buildings for student use that might not be in in use right now. Jane, do you have a question? Yeah, I the one that I'm thinking of right now. I, I have a handful, but I'm going to address this one first. So. Um, I'm looking at the school administration budgets and I'm looking at the payroll for principal and assistant principal. And it looks like at Crocker Farm and Wildwood, uh, actually at all three, the principals are getting a pay cut and the assistant principals are either remaining flat or in the case of Crocker Farm, there's a slight increase. But I, are we having, do we have that much staffing turnover or like what would the reason for a decrease for the, in the payroll for the principal and not even a slight bump for the assistant principal? I guess that just seems a little hinky. So uh, this is where I get to, to be embarrassed um, because, because I believe in uh, reviewing that uh, in going from last year to what we budgeted and put into the budget last year for our principals was uh, was incorrect. To be perfectly honest, um, we had counted it. so most most of those type of staff have a base salary, and then they have a few things like longevity or uh, additional pay for for a doctoral degree. Those types of things. There are a few different categories of additional pay that people receive, um, and I think we double counted the additional pay. So in each you know, in each of those cases, there was a a, a few thousand dollars for those uh, principals that we essentially double counted, so we over budgeted in the current year. Um, so we corrected that for fiscal 22, it makes it look like we're cutting their pay, which really isn't the case. Um, the other general, you know, uh, approach we've taken with with those folks is that, you know, we are in, in negotiations. And so in the short term, we, we will, uh, uh, you know, there's not, uh, we'll have step increases for our assistant principals, uh, principals all are on what's called committee action. Um, and we we hold those at a zero percent cola until a decision is made for the district generally, and that involves, you know, uh, uh, a broad set of, of factors. But you know, some of it's the negotiation with the unions on their potential cola. Um, so what we, you know, we we have accounted for potential cost of living increases, uh, but not directly in the line that, that it sits in right now. I guess is the best way to describe that. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Mandy? Yeah, um, so I was looking at the total budget, not just for this year, and I know I've been concentrating on a lot of cuts and how you guys present a budget and then level services and then all these cuts and all, but I was looking at the projecteds for the next couple of years and all of the payroll account increases and um, and then looking at the projected from the manager budget, which also projects budgets for elementary schools. And I am concerned, and I, I'm concerned about payrolls increasing above two and a half percent a year. And I don't know whether we can change that or not. But as you know, we've got caps on how much we can increase our property taxes. And you have projected in your budget a three and a half percent increase every year for level services, and then an actual 2.7 increase in um, sort of the funded budget, the projected actual budget, the managers project projected a two and a half increase in out years. Um, so right off the bat, they don't even agree. <laughs> um, but 
what is the school's plan, um, given that we likely can't go much above two and a half percent any year um, when payroll, and, and this is this is going to be a question for the manager and all when we get to that. So it's not just the schools when payroll increases above two and a half percent. Right. So I think that the, the um, you know, that is a, that's a difficulty we face. I mean, I think that you know, at, at, like I said earlier, you know, our, our staff are getting younger, so they're not all at the top step. Um, you know, if everybody's at the top step, then as long as your cola is less than the 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 prop two and a half limitation, you know, your salaries stay within the bounds of what you need to, to have happen. Um, uh, so it, it, you know, it is, it's an inherent structural problem that we have. I don't deny that we've, we, you know, this, the, the difference between our steps, uh, in our, in our salary grid is about, like I said before, about 4% on average. Um, and so that does pose an, an inherent, uh, conflict. Um, uh, the other thing I will say just about those projected out years, I did not spend a lot of time reviewing or thinking about the projection percentages I used. I, I mean, I did some, obviously I wasn't, but I, did, I also took very conservative numbers. So, you know, for example, um, if you were to look closely at the line that contains pensions, I, you know, it has a fairly large jump uh, from one year to the next, uh, you know, that goes four or 5%. It's got a health insurance increase of three to 5%. You know, the, those may not always be the case. Our increase in insurance this year was 1%. So, uh, you know, th those are things that, that help offset those increases in just raw salaries from folks. But it, it, there's no doubt that that's a, that, you know, we have an awareness of that structural problem that we have. Um, and I think on, on the town side, they do too, as, as far as their contracts and, and their uh, staffing is concerned. They've got the same, uh, you know, structural problems. And, you know, I could go on about prop two and a half forever if you want to, you know, you want to commiserate about how that's structured. But, but uh, you know, there's good and bad about it. I mean, it does pose some limits that are, like I say, good and bad. Um, but, but nonetheless, it does, uh, you know, it, it is a, a clear point of, of concern for us as we move ahead that we keep in mind uh, as we're hiring, as we're staffing, as we're thinking about the number of kids we have and we're thinking about what's possible. Um, you know, the, the fortunate thing in Amherst is there is some new growth, which helps make the overall increase from one year to the next more than just the prop two and a half. You know, you get into some of the smaller communities that we partner with in our regional school district, you know, you know Pelham, Leverett, Shutesbury, their new growth could be very, very small. And so they're really, you know, two and a half is really kind of the reality for them uh, on a year over year basis. Amherst has fortunately some new growth most years uh, that helps draw that number up a little higher than two and a half percent. But that's certainly something as, as a district and any department for that matter in the, in the, in the, in the town, it's got to uh, keep that in mind as to uh, how to, how to stay within the, the, the revenue that's available to it, to the community. Okay, Linda, did you hear yeah. something else? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, this is sticking on the same theme on uh, the issue of salaries. And I remember a conversation that I believe took place during the regional school budget discussions about the possibility that someone like the town manager might be involved or his designee uh, might be involved in contract negotiations um, other than just with the town, but also on um, at representing the town in the school. And I didn't know if that had happened or if it is happening. And then I have another question. I really don't know. <laughs> okay. so, unfortunately, the superintendent might've been able to answer that one, but I, I can't. I don't know if they've um, connected that way or not. I mean, it's a it's a huge burden to ask him, but at the same time, there did seem to be some interest during the regional school uh, meetings of having the town kind of sitting at the table, if you will, during those negotiations. Um, perhaps, you know, I hate to say it, bringing some of the reality of something that, for instance, like the thing Mandy Jo just pointed out. Um, the second thing is, and, and this really goes back to the broader question of enrollment trends, and um, I, I understand it's a, particularly in this year, it is a complete and free-flowing picture, okay? But from, from my standpoint, what would be most useful is to understand by school, by elementary school, by grade, what the enrollment trend has been over the last five years and then update that 
I mean, higher ed uses October as its date. I, I think I actually elementary and secondary uses October as its date as well. Uh, I think that might be a federal number, uh, a federal um, kind of landmark, but just so we can understand. And, and I think part of the understanding there is, again, um, you know, a class of 25 is not acceptable in Amherst, but at some point, how do we deal with a class where there might be two and a half sixth grades instead of two sixth grades? And how do we start thinking about that? And I'm particularly interested in that as Andy um, has suggested, and this is actually at the regional level, but um, as we start looking at the impact of overall decline in birth rates in New England and particularly uh, how it affects Amherst. And it, it's continuing. I mean, it's just, uh, we're, we're, not, we're not nice warm states where people wanna live. Um, so. Well, I think that it's regarding- a request, it's, a, it's a request going forward. That, right, and, and we do you know, look at the, the enrollment uh, you know, by grade level year over year. Um, you know, we classically used a, a, what they call a survival model, a five-year survival model. The hardest one to predict is the kindergarten because you know, the only thing you've got is, is births in Amherst from five years previously. It's the only number you've got. And that's, you know, uh, a lot of people with young children move frequently, I guess is the simplest way to say it. Uh, so it's, it's not a real indicator of, of, of what's going to show up on your doorstep. Um, I mean, the trends have been downward, um, and I think they'll they'll continue to be uh, in that that same range. I, at the same time, I I personally see, and this is just my own observation, so it's a bit of just an opinion. But you know, Amherst is making an investment in affordable housing, um, and I think we will see some moderation of the decline by virtue of that to some extent. I don't think it's going to be huge, um, but I do think it will moderate that that decline a little bit uh, for the for the next few years and I think depending on our housing policies in Amherst particularly it's still a very attractive place to live it's a fairly expensive place to live though so uh, it, it is uh, you know why we have a bit of a bimodal uh, you know economic picture in Amherst where we have uh, fairly well to do and fairly not so well to do and not a lot of middle and um, and our schools reflect that in a lot of ways um, and, and so I think that we definitely, you know, we definitely look at those kind of numbers regularly. We, you know, certainly in the process with the with MSBA and the, uh, the building, one of the, the critical sort of first steps is, is trying to get uh, uh, good numbers of, of what do we think our future looks like for enrollments because they don't want to build a building that's way too big or way too small uh, for a building that's going to last a long time. So they, they try to go through a fairly arduous process to, to identify how many kids you're going to have, uh, what your need at the buildings are going to be. Um, I know certainly when we, when you have uh, the structure we have and and you try to uh, have the right number of classes in each of the grade levels, uh, it gets tricky, um, you know, because, you know, you have that, uh, you've got uh, 36 kids uh, in, say, third grade. So you go, oh, that's two classes of 18. But if you had 30, which you go 215, you know, you, you, there are these weird break points with adding a section or taking away a section. We try to be proactive in thinking about that. I mean, certainly at the kindergarten level in, in years past, we've done things where we've moved kids to a different building um, just because the, the, the need to keep those class sizes as small as we like to uh, was, was such that that was the case. And we've done that. And, and um, you know, we generally you know, stay within the targets that the school committee has set and, and, uh, and are able to have you know, sort of reasonable section sizes in that regard, but but there are certainly years that we have some you know some things where it's it's uh, it's pretty expensive because you'll have you know sixteen or seventeen in a class instead of twenty or twenty one, and that that makes that class a lot more expensive. There's just no way around uh, saying it. I'll just add one quick follow up, and that is uh, if uh, the school building committee and MS uh, in uh, Go for the uh, larger, single larger elementary school to replace two current elementary schools. That will provide us more flexibility, I assume. Uh, it will, I think. Um, in the in that, you know, it, it's. Um, I mean, it, it, if you remember from the last uh, time around, you know, there was some conversation about whether we should build, you know, should have a K to two school, 
and, you know, sort of cluster all of a certain grade, certain grade levels in single buildings because that's going to give you the most efficiency with how many sections you have. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know if the conversations will head in that direction again, but certainly a you know two schools versus three gives you a little more uh, ability to keep those class sizes balanced than you know than uh, two buildings does that better than three does as far as. Uh, keeping those class sizes more on target with with what you want and and to be efficient with it, but uh, don't know how that'll all play out ultimately. Okay, uh, Kathy, unless your question is along the same lines, uh, I know that Dorothy and George had their hands up, and then I was going to come back to you. Mine was just an offer as part of the elementary school building project. There were estimates somewhat what you're asking for, Lynn, about class sizes in each of the cohorts, and I'd be glad to send that to everyone. There's a grid. That's it. Cut the thumbs up from Lynn, so I, thank you for that suggestion. Dorothy, and then George. So Dorothy. I am concerned about some way for our school to get more control of what's going on, um, because it, right now, uh, there's no limits on to uh, in terms of uh, special ed and the balance could tip um, so that there's lack of equity for the other students. Um, and of course, one of the reasons is incentive. You have a good program. People want to come to a good program, but an incentive to get other people into your school system is good kindergarten and, and universal pre-K. Um, that would get people to say, I want to live in Amherst and go to that school. Um, so I'm right now, it, I just, it just seems you're just too reactive to what happens outside of you and without much, much way of controlling it. Um, I have some comments on class size, um, in neighboring schools, 18 seems to be the top number of students that most people want in elementary school. Um, and at Holyoke Community College, they're having some in-person classes this fall. They're capping those classes at 10. So uh, I think any class over 18 is getting into um, not good territory for um, um, average students who will learn to be absolutely quiet as mice and say nothing if the, the bigger the class gets. So I'm just wondering if you've had thoughts about ways of getting a little bit more control over what kind of classes you have. So um, uh, I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit, you know. So, so um, in in speaking relative to you know special education, we're required to, you know, the term that gets used is FAPE, which is uh, free and appropriate public education. So, some of the requirements by federal law uh, for funding and and support requires that you uh, provide uh, what's necessary for a child to access the curriculum, um, and and so that's you know so when the kid you know, it, it shows up on our doorstep where we have a, you know, an obligation uh, and that's immutable in some respects. Um, there are things we can do um, as far as our programming uh, that, that and, and we do look at, you know, do we, uh, and, and we review regularly to try to keep those costs as, as uh, reasonable as we can given the, given the, uh, you know, expectations of what we're trying to do. And, and you know, and again, I think that, uh, the, uh, you know, if parents are going to shop around where they live, um, which they do, I mean, people do that whether their kids has a special needs or not, they should. Um, you know, it's it's a result of how our system set up relative to property tax paying the you know, line share and state taxes paying the other part of it. Um, but I think that you know we certainly look at at how we're expending and and how expensive our 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 programming is and how best to, to make those as efficient as we can to keep them uh, at a high level of, of performance, but also at, a, at, a, at as reasonable price as we can. Um, so we're, we're routinely looking at those, those types of things, um, certainly, and, and, and obviously, you know, in, in some ways, uh, I would suggest, you know, some would talk about the fact that, that we're in a competitive market because of charter schools and the options and school choice, the, the options that family has to choose different schools. Um, uh, so, you know, we try to offer things that, that uh, help retain our students in our buildings. Um, and, and that's one piece um, among many reasons that, you know, we have the Comandante's program in, in Fort River is to help provide that 
a differentiating factor that might encourage a family to, to be or, or move in, into Amherst. And so, you know, we are thinking of those kinds of things as, as best we can, um, but we do operate under some limitations, there's no doubt. Uh, but, but certainly, you know, if you have other suggestions, we're, we're happy to hear them and, and think about it. And obviously, you know, there are, like I say, around like special education, we are compelled by law to, to meet those requirements and, and morally as well, but, but certainly uh, legally and financially we are as in, in, in addition. Just to follow up on the preschool question, though, um, have you thought of having more preschool as a way of making the district more attractive to more people? Um, I think, and I'm going to probably be outside my realm of expertise here. Uh, but I believe so is the short answer I would say there. I think we certainly look at it. I mean, there are some, you know, given the things that we're compelled to do uh, and requirements we're compelled to meet, certainly I think that, uh, you know, growing the, the, uh, the peers part of the program for the kids that don't have the needs is, is certainly an area that we've looked at and certainly continue to look at and, and uh, you have to strike the right balance as far as capacity to do that. But yeah, absolutely. I think that's something we look at. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna recognize George and then I'm gonna um, actually um, see if there's any public comment that people from the, um, who are attending the meeting from the public who wish to um, mm -hmm. pose while we're on the subject of schools because we can come back for a second round when we get to other programs. But it, um, we, when we draw close to schools, um, I want to do that But George. Yeah, just really not a question. And I apologize for that, but just two comments though. If, if I'm off base here with my claims of fact, I would very much like to be corrected. Um, we're looking at enrollment data over five years, which is fine, but when I look at enrollment, I'm looking over 20 years, we, we're seeing a decline in enrollment that goes back to the beginning of this century. Um, according to the numbers that I've put together, and I, they, perhaps they're not right, but I, I'm looking at a figure of like 32% decline from 2001 to the present, give or take. Um, it's, a, it's a steady decline that's been going on for quite some time, not just the last four or five years is my reading of, of what I, I see. Um, so that is deeply concerning. Um, just looking at four or five years, you think, oh, well, 4%, you know, whatever, but it's, it's, it's huge is my sense. And if I'm wrong, I need to be corrected. Um, the second is that I think there is a real need for a broader conversation. And I know that a number of us have spoken about this, both at the regional level and with the elementary school. Um, we basically, it seems to me, have two groups, one that negotiates salaries and makes commitments that go on for years, and another group that's responsible for trying to figure out how to balance the budget. And those two really don't seem to be, um, you know, as far as I can see, in close conversation. And so here we are trying to figure out, as Mandy raised the question earlier, uh, how is this sustainable over time? Combined with the decline in enrollments, um, I get really concerned. And as a representative, of, of a constituency, I, I need to be able to explain this to people and, and, and give them a sense of what, what the future is gonna look like and explain to them um, the cost that, that we're facing. And I'm not saying that I can't do that, but right now I, I really struggle to be able to do that. So I'm hoping that over the summer, um, given all the other demands we have on us, that we'll have an opportunity uh, at the elementary level for sure, but hopefully at the regional level to dive deeper and have a much deeper and frank conversation about some of these concerns. Um, so that's just my two cents. If I could just offer a little comment there. Uh, yeah, I, I, the, uh, so technically the, the uh, negotiations with the unions is done with the school committee. Um, formally go into the, you know, and obviously they get support from, from administration. Uh, the school committee gets support from administration to help uh, them inform their their negotiations and their their process in that regard, but at the same time, uh, you know the 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 folks on the school committee, um, you know, are fairly aware of of the constraints in which, under which the town operates, and and it's critical, you know, to communicate to them uh, if if you uh, would like to. Um, I think it's important to communicate to them uh, the constraints and and the pressure you guys are feeling as counselors uh, relative to uh, you know their choices and their actions that are making. Um, but it is a true negotiation, so it, it is one where both sides have to have to come to an agreement. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll largely leave it at that. But it, but the school committee is the is the primary 
uh, uh, negotiator with the union. And so those folks are elected officials of the town and, and, and I would strongly encourage you or any citizens to engage with them on that process and, and, and provide them with information about uh, you know, the, the constraints under which the town's operating and, and keep them aware of, of those limitations that, that you, you know, the town faces is, you know, I mean, I think they are in, 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 I personally would suggest that they are pretty informed about that, but at the same time, you know, they don't do it every day like you guys do. George? Just a quick follow up. You would agree with me, Doug, that the enrollment decline is something that's been going on for quite some time. Yes, absolutely. No, there's no yeah. doubt that that's, that it, it has been a long, it, you know, the, the trick this year yeah. has been a bit abrupt yeah. in that, right. but, but yeah, the, the trend has been a uh, longstanding in Amherst, you know, and, and Western Mass generally, uh, that, that we've had a decline and, and, uh, you know, the, the, unfortunate thing from the standpoint of sort of the structure of your school is because you have class sizes of say 20 or 25, you know, somewhere in that range, uh, you have to lose that many students in that building in that grade to reduce by one, you know, so it, it tends to be the, the transitions between, uh, you know, 65 elementary school teachers to 64, you know, those tend to come in steps and so there's often, uh, it, it, it doesn't track quite as smoothly as the oh, decline in enrollment. And so that's, that's a tricky thing to sort of see, you know, but if, if we were to look back uh, in at 2000, 2001, and look at the number of like elementary classrooms we had versus now, I mean, we closed the school building in the meantime by virtue of that decline in enrollment um, in, in about 2009, 2010. So we'll, we may continue to see that. Um, and I think that's, a, that's, you know, for, for, for uh, Kathy and, and the group on the on the building committee, that's going to be a critical question as they look at those projections of enrollment. How big a building do we want uh, and do we need as we look forward and, and try to build the right size to meet our needs now, but in the future and 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 uh, you know sort of hit the sweet spot. Okay, I had said that I would uh, pause for a moment after George and see if either of the attendees uh, would like to comment. I think one of the attendees is um, on the telephone. And if that um, uh, uh, person wishes to raise their hand, um, star nine uh, will cause, um, will let us know that you wish to be recognized. Um, Athena, if you could uh, uh, allow Tony Cunningham to uh, join the meeting so that she can uh, comment. Tony, are you there? Yes, thank you. We, we can hear you. So um, please uh, offer your questions or comments. So while I understand the council votes the bottom line, uh, you can still offer feedback on individual lines in the budget. Therefore, I'd like to request that you fully fund art and technology teachers in the FY22 elementary budget. These, are driven, these cuts are driven by a decision to replace two full-time positions at Crocker Farm with two day per week positions. In addition, the proposal is that the art and technology teachers at both Wildwood and Fort River travel to Crocker Farm one day per week to teach there. This results in art and technology education at all three schools being reduced from five days per week to four days and Crocker Farm children possibly having three different teachers for each subject. While each child is still expected to receive one 40 minute class per week, the reduction to four days will dramatically reduce the amount of time available for arts integration and additional projects at each school. I disagree that the enrollment has declined sufficiently to justify these changes. This fall, Wildwood will likely have 19 or 20 classes and with six teaching blocks in a day, that means the art and tech teachers will have only one open block to do everything else, including prepping for classes and working on any arts integration projects. Anecdotally, when I asked my child and her friends what the highlight of their fourth grade year was, they said it was the Native American project, which was a collaboration between the classroom teacher, art, library, and technology. In third grade, their highlight was the animal adaptation unit, which was also a fabulous example of arts integration. It is project-based learning like these units that engage many children in school and create lasting positive experiences. These are key differentiating factors to retain families in the district. In my opinion, it is short-sighted to make cuts to key differentiators. 
So if we agree that, the, that we value these subjects, the question is how to keep them fully funded in a tough budget year. I will defer to you all to review where in the budget um, funds could potentially be moved around, but I would like to suggest that you earmark $75,000 of the expected ESSER 3 funds, which are due to be announced in the next few weeks. We saw on Monday that the town manager plans to use 100,000 of the American Rescue Plan to pay for a capital projects manager. So there is precedent for using these expected funds to pay for staffing. I understand that the budget as presented does not include ESSER or American Rescue Plan funds as a separate pot of money. And lastly, on a separate issue, I noticed the Crocker Farm feasibility study improvements have been removed from the pending list in the capital improvement plan. And I would urge that you restore that item to the list as it is a significant cost and will likely be needed to be spent in the next five to 10 years. Thank you. Uh, any follow up? Uh, this is a I guess the one thing that um, just so that people have, um, there's been reference made to ESSER, which is an unusual name, that's Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, and it has been included as a part of each of the federal um, stimulus assistance uh, uh, legislation bills that have been passed in Congress over time. Um, and plus the most recent is the American Recovery Act. Um, and uh, so the ESSER funds are a part of that which were designated for elementary and secondary schools. Um, and, uh, you know, the rules under which they, uh, those funds can be utilized is I think um, something that is beyond me to explain. So I'm not even gonna try, um, but, um, it, it is a uh, the question of uh, whether ESSER can replace um, other budget cuts like this, or is there's a way to do it? I don't. I I frankly do not have an answer to that from my own knowledge. Uh, Lynn, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just need to note that George will be leaving, but since Darcy has joined us, we still have a quorum of the council. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, Bernie Kubiak. Uh, thanks. Uh, to a to, um, couple of observations, actually. The school committee has broad, broad latitude in how it spends money that um, it's appropriated by the town uh, to the point where the budget is could actually be considered to be more of a suggestion than an actual spending plan. And I've, I've unfortunately seen that done, not with this school committee, but with, with another. Um, <clears throat> I think one of, the, one of the problems we have with, you know, two and a half was designed to start the beast. It wasn't designed to be helpful. It was designed to force governments to be smaller. Uh, that's a problem we always face, but looking at what's been said about the composition of the faculty right now, this might be an opportune time to raise the very difficult question of separating out steps and codes so that you don't get an automatic four, four and a half percent um, salary increase each year. Um, that might have a moderating effect and, and there may be some ways to massage that and to, to make that happen. Um, it's, a difficult, uh, it's a difficult ask. And I, I, I'm saying that from, as someone who's tried. Um, the other observation is that um, we, we can't ask the school administration or the school committee to judge how we do land use. And the way we use land right now in town, the way town, town is organized, um, we don't have an ample supply of workforce or middle income housing. And so we're not going to see, no matter how attractive we make preschool, we're not going to see a, a, an inflow into town because people can't afford it. Uh, one way that we can, and this will can come up in other discussions, um, is to uh, to make sure that we have uh, um, we have an opportunity to move um, that 
50% of single family homes that are rentals now to move those folks out and make some of that housing available to families. And so that's gonna get us into questions later about we talked to the planning board about land use. Um, and when we look at um, uh, downtown development and the creation of more apartments. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Kathy, you. Yeah, I, I want to do um, a follow up on the public comment we just had with a question. Um, the timing, Doug, um, if, if we learn more about ESSER in the next whatever, four weeks, five weeks, you know, before July 1. Um, the, the art and technology piece that the $75,000, which was a reduction in time, um, if, if there can be something done, because whether it's a direct offset of that or that the town can shift some money that was in another budget because of some relief somewhere, what does the timing of that have to look like if you were, um, I wasn't sure whether you were reducing a whole slot, so saying goodbye to a person um, in terms of when you give a, a termination notice or we're reducing you to part-time. Um, so the, re, the way you were reconfiguring the hours to be able to staff the Crocker. We've, we've gotten more than just this one comment on this. We just got another one today, um, but we've had several coming directly to the council to try to do something, you know, and I don't know what the school committee heard. So it's, it's a question of if the finance committee said, I know we can't put the money, but we said, Paul, we're hearing this. Can you as the manager figure out some way for this piece? So I'm just looking for timing, a, a timing question. Yeah. So, so just to give you a little, uh, piece of this uh, at, at Crocker Farm, the, the two staff that are, are uh, there in those roles are one's leaving the district, one's retiring. Um, so no individual is being, uh, is being let go for that purpose. Um, we'll probably, I believe that the strategy at the moment, I'm not 100% sure, would be to ask that uh, folks in our other two buildings take a day of you know, their current full-time position, uh, but it would require hiring a point four uh, for each of those. Um, you know, we sometimes partner with, you know, other districts like Pelham that are smaller that have people that are working uh, partial uh, in those in those similar areas. Um, you know, I don't know if if the if if a person at Pelham would be able to, or willing to do that, or we would have to reach out to you know Shrewsbury, Leverett, or any you know Hadley, uh, you know any number of schools that have uh, folks in those those sorts of uh, uh, areas to to hire a part time. Uh, person, so that would be for the current structure of what we have. Um, as far as you know, the ability to 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 hire and plan for for uh, you know a, a full time person, um, I think that the the window of opportunity is there to you know to talk about hiring staff is is there. Um, <clears throat> uh, as far as the mechanics of of um, of the budget. Uh, you know, if if the school committee were to reconsider and and change, you know, well, if they had you know advice that that funding was available and and that they were willing to take that up and change that, and uh, then I think that it's possible to do that. I just you know I don't want to commit them to it or anything like that, but I think that uh, the 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 town budget because it doesn't have to be passed until you know before July one, you've got a little more time. Um, you know, the the mechanical steps would have to happen between. Uh, you know, the manager of the school committee and ultimately the council, but I presume that they would be, it would be possible, I believe, but um, you know, a little out of the realm of my expertise on some of that, you know, specifics in that regard, but, <clears throat> and I don't know, I have no idea of, of the school committee's mindset relative to this or, or quite frankly, superintendents as far as if that were to be uh, actively uh, pursued. I don't know. I haven't had the conversations about that, so I don't know. Thank you. Bob Hagner. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of echo the comments of uh, some of the uh, previous uh, speakers. And um, when we had our conversation about the budget guidelines so many months back, we talked quite a bit about sustainability 
um, as being an important piece of um, the budgets and, and the town finances going forward. And we also discussed, you know, two major drivers of sustainability, especially for the schools, which were the declining enrollment and the increased uh, costs of salaries every year. And I think it's very clear that those two issues are still very much the issues that we need to be wrestling with. Um, I think special education may be another issue. I don't see it as such a a big problem right now, but if it continues to grow, if the costs continue to grow over time, it could become a third issue of sustainability. But I think right now the biggest issue are really issues are the enrollment and then the people costs, basically. Um, so I, I, I do echo those those comments. And I think, as I said, I think that's where we need to be focused, uh, both as a committee and as you know, a town on on how we're going to sustain, you know, the the quality of education that we have. Doug, and if I could, uh, that just reminds me of a point, and this this goes back to when Andy and I served on finance committee a million years ago. But but it's one I'll bring up at this point, just because I think it's uh, important relative to to this conversation, and, and it's not necessarily specific to the 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 uh, comment by the by the caller, um, and that is, is, is the use of one-time money uh, to support your operating budget. And so with something like the ESSER funds in particular or other resources that are, are uh, not recurring on the, on the revenue side, in other words, uh, you know, there's not a, a, a stream of, of revenue to continue to support it, um, you find yourself uh, back to the same problem uh, just delayed by a year or so. Um, so to go back in history a little bit with the town of Amherst, we, we got a grant, oh goodness, probably 15 years ago or more, probably 20 years ago and it ended 15 years ago, uh, that allowed for the hiring of uh, four or five firefighters. And uh, the, the difficulty with that grant was, is when that grant ended, uh, we essentially had to let those people go. We didn't have the budget to, it was not a great budget year. And so we didn't have the opportunity to uh, fold those or factor those those new salaries into our, our uh, public safety uh, budget. And that was a really difficult conversation at town meeting, quite frankly. Um, and I think that there, there are grants we have and, and the town has had over time where it's a, tr it's a smoother transition. In other words, they build in that you are taking on a bit more and more of, of those kind of costs as the grant uh, progresses through. Um, but that is, that is one of those concerns. Anytime you have sort of you know, one-time money like a grant or, or uh, something from uh, reserves that you, you fund is that then how do you solve the problem the following year or, or two years down the line or, or that sort of thing. So when you talk sustainability, that's certainly a factor that's gotta be kept in mind um, as, we, as we consider these kind of options. Good point, Doug, even though reliving old times, not always easy. Uh, Mandy? Yeah, I, I kind of want to echo what Bernie said um, about we pass a bottom line budget for the school committee, um, or and frankly, for most of the town. Um, and how the school committee who are elected, just like the town council, decides to spend that budget is not something we as a town council should probably get too far into the weeds in, I would say. And I think we have to remember that the school committee was presented with a budget number that Dr. Slaughter and Dr. Morris have been presenting to us today, the town manager did not change that number. Um, and they were fully aware that that seven, that one of the cuts planned was to arts integration programs. And they still passed that budget and asked us to pass that budget. Um, and so I, I get very concerned when we're looking at essentially doing policy when policy on school committee cuts when policy is on school committee cuts is not what we as town councilors were elected to do. And I just wanted to, I just wanted to echo that because that always concerns me. Um, and that's, um, you know, at the start of the meeting, I said, we actually have a way to increase a school committee budget that, that we'd come back to. It's not just regional schools, but it requires the school committee to ask us and recommend that we do so, but we are we've been presented with 
their recommended budget. We haven't been presented with a budget that they passed that then our town manager reduced by $100,000. He passed through the budget they passed. Um, and so that's their recommendation to us. And I think we have a, an, in some sense, an obligation to recognize that they were elected to decide whether those cuts were okay with them and pass a budget on to us. And they, they did that. Okay, no, thank you, Mandy. Um, you going back to, to remind me again of the provision in chapter 44, section 32, uh, which provides that uh, it, would, it has to originate from the school committee, the request to increase the budget and it has to passed by two thirds of the council in order to increase the school budget. And that is that one anomaly. However, uh, is, uh, since you were on the uh, Charter Commission, the Charter Commission did not include that in the charter. And uh, I- It is part of state law and the charter has um, as allowed by state law. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to make sure we were clear on that. Um, so going back to Dorothy, then your hand was up and then, because uh, I want to try and spend a few more minutes on the schools and then we need to get on to the other subjects. I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, I do think that Mandy's point is very interesting. We have two elected boards, both responsible to the people of the town to represent their needs and um, both trying to do it. So that's why you kind of get the second run, but I do, I do, it's an important point. So my question is, um, why was there no school choice last year? Um, I, school choice brings in money to the district and it wasn't offered. So, you know, you lost a couple, you lost potentially a number of students who would have come in last year. So, um, yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that question. So the 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 goal with school choice generally is not to increase your costs. And so what we would like to do generally in any given year is the students that we take in would be filling in slots. So let's say we have small class sizes in Wildwood and we try to, you know, mm -hmm. level up those classes. And, and so we didn't feel at the time that we had uh, any space for new students. We certainly kept all the students we had. So we still had school choice revenue. Um, uh, and so that's the evaluation we make each year as far as uh, our taking on students is can we do it in a way that that will uh, generally, you know, uh, augment from a resource standpoint, but not necessarily uh, from an expense for us. So, um, you know, that's the rationale we go with it. But again, it's, it's a bit of, uh, as, as is always the case with a lot of these things is, uh, you know, a bit of uh, uh, forecasting, a, a bit of crystal ball reading is necessary because mm -hmm. you have to make the decisions fairly early relative to the the reality on the ground when school starts. Thank you. And I think the, the added piece to that is that uh, the amount of money you get from school choice uh, is $5,000. That's what the sending district transfers to the receiving district. And $5,000 is well under the cost of educating a student so that if you take school choice to the point of having to add staff, which takes in more, um, adds more costs than the revenue coming in, you get back to the point that why Doug is making the point he made. Um, so Bernie and then Kathy. Yeah, just more of a point of information it would be helpful if we we're going to talk about ESSER or any other any other source of funds other than what we raise and appropriate. Um, it would be helpful to know if what the ground rules around those are. If those are simply going to go to the school committee, yes, her funds are simply going to go to the school committee for the school committee's use. Whether a grant is simply going to go to the town manager, uh, it would be helpful to know who's uh, who's driving the bus in terms of those funds, uh, and not make the assumption that this is that ESSER money would be necessarily appropriated by the uh, council. Yeah, I don't know, Sean or. Paul, have an answer, when to answer that. Uh, I can speak briefly on that. Um, I think Bernie's right. I think um, ESSER money goes straight to the schools. That does not come through the town. Um, 
it goes through Title One, so it's right, Doug, or it's go, goes through Title One allocation. So um, that goes for straight through um, to the schools. Um, ARPA money, we imagine, will be similar to how CARES money came in, um, but we're not sure until we see the, the detailed rules, um, which again, we hope to see um, along with the ESSER money any week now. Um, but they've been saying that for, I think MMA had a article like four weeks ago saying detailed guidance coming soon. Um, so their definition of soon is uh, four to six weeks, I think. Um, so, so we're really eager to see what those rules are and, um, and we'll update the committee as soon as we get them. Kathy, did you have anything? Your hand was up. No, I just forgot to take my hand down. Sorry. Okay. So uh, I think that we've uh, spent a fair amount of time in the school, so I do want to get on and have some uh, time for the remaining agenda items having to do with social services. Uh, and uh, so I wanted to see if there are any last questions. Mandy, your hand is, you, you had something else? It's not for the school. It's it's more about. Um, I wasn't sure whether today would be the a discussion on community responder because it was not really included in any of your finance committee agendas. So I'm trying to figure out where that portion of community services, when that portion of community services will be discussed. Yeah, actually, we're going to take that up as soon as we uh, finished, and I think the um, because that is um, not a. There's not a clear answer to that. I think the committee needs to discuss that. Um, so just see who loves up on school so that Doug can get on to other things with his day because we really appreciate you spending this much time with us, Doug. Uh, Pat, did you have something? Uh, yes, my question doesn't have to do with the schools. I'm just uh, asking a budget clarification. So thank you, Doug, Mr. Slaughter, as always, for your good work. Okay, um, so uh, nothing else uh, at this point on the schools. Kathy, you had, uh, I know you had a long list, so I think, we, um, but you had already sent them and got some responses already, so I know. So anyway, uh, thank you very much, Doug. I appreciate it and thank uh, Mike. That, and um, I'm sorry that we got messed up with the, um, uh, hosting having been missed, but uh, and having to put it off for a day. I appreciate the flexibility and sorry that uh, he wasn't able to stay with us longer, but we understand that Desio is, is an important competing source. So uh, anyway, thank you very much, Doug. And, um, You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you guys for having us and, and we appreciate the time you, you've allowed for us and certainly reach out to us if you have other questions. Thank you. So let me get back to the question that was just raised um, about uh, the community responder program. It, it technically is under social services and therefore it is on the agenda for today's meeting. Um, but I actually had been thinking about that for a while because of a couple of additional factors. One is that um, we um, haven't seen the report from the working group yet. And, um, you know, it doesn't, it looks like the timing is going to be difficult. We might see the report, but it won't have been presented to the council for council discussion if we, um, before we probably have to address it in this committee, given the fact that we have a time limit on our work too. Um, so, but that's a problem. Um, one of the ideas that I had come up with was to at least postpone it until uh, the day that the police budget is heard because they tie together um, in, in a uh, obvious way that I won't have to, I don't really don't have to state. Um, and uh, I think that we might have the working group report by that date, though it won't have been, as I say, discussed in the council at that point. So I had sent something to uh, Sean and Paul to ask uh, their thoughts about um, that scheduling and uh, probably should just clarify that now. So, um, because it sounds like that's um, 
why you might want to stay with the meeting or not. So is there any comments from the committee and Paul? So I, I think you should not talk about it today because the community safety working group isn't here and I think they should be, they would want to be present. Uh, they have, um, I know they've posted an extra meeting for early next week to work on their report to get it to you sooner. Uh, their anticipation is that it would be discussed on, on May 13th when you talk about the police budget. That's their expectation, but that was not, you know, you can make your decision on when you want to bring it up, but they were saying, oh, public safety is going to be discussed on May 13th. We should be prepared for that. So I think, I think having clarity on when it is going to come up would be helpful to everybody. Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't be today because uh, clearly nobody's ready for it today. So um, I guess my question then to the rest of the finance committee is, uh, um, is there any objection to postponing the discussion of the uh, social services section, which is really just that part of the uh, community services budget uh, until the 13th when we, um, we, and then add it to that agenda. And I do note that that will make for a busy agenda that day, but um, all of our agendas turn out to be busy agendas. Is there, Lynn? I think that is absolutely appropriate. Uh, I think it would be in really not appropriate for us to have that discussion without some significant notification to the community safety working group. And I also would suggest that we set a time specific in the, on that day when uh, we will have that discussion. And furthermore, I think we should actually um, have some level of uh, interaction with them about whether or not they're available during these hours, since they have de generally been meeting at five o'clock. And perhaps for the purpose of this discussion, we need to be more flexible in our time. Okay. Uh, so thank you for that suggestion. Um, maybe Sean or Paul can uh, check with them just to make sure that that works. And, uh, but uh, if there's uh, no objection from the committee and I'll look for hands raised to, to indicate um, that somebody wants to be raised to object, then we will not discuss it today. And as chair that um, I will add it to the agenda on the 13th, if it's agreeable to the working group and they can have representation present. And, and feel that uh, they're ready to present the discussion. So seeing no objection, then that is what the plan is. And uh, we will focus then on Senior Center and Veteran Services, um, for the, uh, which are the two parts of the budget that um, we can discuss today. Yes, Lynn. My concern is so in other words, we're saying the finance committee, which could be a committee of the whole, is gonna have the discussion with the community safety working group before they present to the council. This is, it's becoming very difficult all the way around because they have actually said at the last meeting that they would like to present at the council on the 24th, uh, which sets back even later than the 17th. I don't, I don't have a great solution to resolve this. I just am saying that it seems a little backward to have them come to the finance committee meeting before coming to the council. Yeah, no, I think that that's a problem. And of course, what we're um, having to deal with, and maybe we should take this up separately and then come back to the committee uh, either by email or next Thursday with further report on this. But um, our last day of budget review um, is uh, the 20th. So we're still out of sync on time. And then we have a meeting for the 20, excuse me, we have one meeting left. I guess we have the 27th. Yeah, Andy, we could, um, I mean, we could still do the different departments on the 13th, but we could also have a follow-up conversation on the 27th. Cause I think there is, um, 
I think that meeting's not scheduled to be a full meeting the way it is right now. It just has um, conservation development, which I think would probably be a, maybe an hour and a half for those three groups. Um, so it's possible that something could be put onto the, to that meeting on the 27th. What do we have on the 25th? Because we have a finance committee meeting that day too. What it, that I think that's be? general government. And there's a lot of um, sort of smaller departments in that group. Well, just looking that we have we didn't have a meeting on the 25th. Uh... Oh, sorry. It's whatever the one right before the 27th. Uh, let me get my calendar. The general government was is a CRC meeting. That's why you don't have one scheduled for the 25th. I yes, I think the 20th is when we're doing general government. General government, yeah. Okay. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, so I, I just want to say, because Lynn asked, since I'm not a finance member, that if it's not getting discussed today and it sounds like it's not, I'm going to cut out of the meeting and leave it now, which I believe leaves the council without a quorum. Yes. Then in that count, in that case, the town council meeting is adjourned. The finance committee meeting continues. Thank you. Um, I, have, I, I have another question that's not related to community safety working group. So whenever whenever you're ready, but Pat has okay, uh, Pat. Yeah, I just want a budget clarification. Um, I was I understand um, that as a town council, we can only Pat, I think you're frozen. Yeah. Athena, uh, let us know if there's something that needs to be resolved. And, uh, We'll get back to Pat's question when she's available to ask it. Um, so, Linda, do you have anything else to add, or your hand because your hand is still up? It's my other the other thing I want to talk about, and I I'm more than willing to wait on that. Whatever. Well, well let me go ahead. Uh, since Pat's broken, one of the things that we have said is that at each of the town council meetings. Uh, as we're going through this budget, there would be updates. And at the same time, I have been under the impression that- Excuse me, I got kicked out somehow. So- yeah, we'll so get Whoops, she got kicked out again. Uh, you got kicked out again? Yeah. Anyway, exactly. uh, in, in two ways, I need to ask this question. In the past, we have been, um, the finance committee report has often been much more, very pretty extensive when it came to reporting on the budget. And yet some people have felt that that really wasn't as necessary. Um, so I, I'm asking, what is our expectation for a written report at the end of the budget review, review by the finance committee? And the second question I'm asking is, what is the expectation or what expectation do we as a finance committee want to set for what it is we will report on on the 17th and on the 24th of May? Okay. At some point, I'd like an answer to my question. I apologize. I seem to have gotten thrown out of the meeting. So go back with you, restate your question, and then we'll come back. Well, I'm trying to understand. Um, last year, when we wanted to, we had to freeze two positions, and that gave us some flexibility, because I understand that as a council, we cannot decrease a line item and then move money. However, it does say in the charter that upon the recommend, except on the recommendation of the town manager, we can't increase. So if the town, that puts a lot of responsibility on Paul to make recommendations uh, about changing funding. And I think that uh, there's gonna, there needs to be quite a bit of conversation about changing funding for the uh, CREST program 
And so I'm trying to understand how we go about that. Um, because it seems to me that, yes, Paul makes the recommendation, but we need to give him feedback uh, about what we think should be happening. And then he can do, he can make his decision. So I'm trying to understand how this is gonna work and when we're gonna do this. I think we need to have the discussion of the program first before we can. But we can move money and, uh, and a line item could be increased upon the recommendation of the town manager. That would be based on what we were asking him to do. If the town manager, it's my understanding that if the town manager makes that request, then we can consider it otherwise. Right, but uh, we can give him feedback and input that might help him decide to make or not make that decision. And I'm trying to understand when do we get to do that? Um, know that there's a specific name time that might be just during discussion. I don't know if Paul has any comments on that. And Andy, can I add real quick? Um, yeah. You know, I think there will, I think we have time set aside at the end of this process for sort of a discussion, uh, sort of a final discussion of the finance committee um, around the report. And that'll, that's after all the departments have come and spoken and you've finished your review. Um, so that might be one time um, sort of when the full picture has been discussed with each of the departments um, for people to share their thoughts. Okay, but the, up until that point with a recommendation from the town manager, funds could be moved around within the budget. Is that correct? So the- um, to So if it. I wanted to take $10,000 right. and move it to public safety, um, and I, and we, when can I have that conversation with the town manager? And so I'm assuming now I would have it during the public safety presentation, mm -hmm. right? And then I could say, and, or the council could say, well, we really want that $10,000. And then if Paul makes that recommendation, it can be moved. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Okay. Because we've been locked into the image yeah. that we had no ability to affect Paul. And I think that's incorrect. Right. And, and Paul and I will talk through this more just to give more sort of um, Thank organized you. feedback as well. Um, I, I think what, what we said makes sense, but I just want to think through it more and um, we'll report back to the whole group on that. Thank you very much. Um, yes. and, and Andy, could I ask, I just want to also just remind um, that Mary Beth is here for um, yes. senior services. and. Um, I know Lynn had a, a good question about what the f um, final report will look like, um, but I wonder if maybe we could hold that till after Mary Beth goes. I think that makes sense. So Mary Beth, um, welcome. I'm finally getting you. And uh, we appreciate uh, your patience and appreciate the good work that's been going on at the Senior Center. Is there any introductory comments that you would like to offer uh, Yes, yes, there is, certainly. So first of all, thank you, everyone. And uh, here at the Senior Center, we are, if nothing else, patient. So I, uh, I appreciated watching the process unfold. And this is much like my day, so I have, no, I have no qualms. But there are a couple of highlights that I think are probably not as clear in the service statistics that I think you would be interested in that might just sort of inform uh, your governance. And the first is, I think it's, it's been very interesting to watch the discussion around elementary schools, because I think that this parallels that. And, and I think it's, it's more to the point around demographic changes. And so I just would uh, like you to have in your awareness as you are looking at uh, town planning for the years to come is that we really need to be considering a plan for aging in Amherst and the demographics underlie that. So in, 20, uh, in 2010, uh, seniors defined as people over 60 were 13% of the population 
And by 2025, within Hampshire County, it will be 30%. So we are certainly graying in the Valley, we are graying in Amherst, and we are graying in the state of Massachusetts. And I think that that is important because that change in that key demographic also has impact on housing, on services, aging in place. Um, and so I, I just think it's, it's not necessarily an immediate state of alarm, but as your uh, elementary population and enrollment decreases, certainly the needs for people to age in place will increase. And I think that, you know, even statistically within the country, you know, two out of 10 people uh, feel like they need help in their home to age in place. And so the social services, while we are a small and mighty department, I think that there might be some discussion moving forward. And, and more importantly, I wanted to just link that to one of my key objectives coming up for this year, which is that we're going to be exploring trying to obtain designation as an age friendly and dementia friendly community, which will allow us to really look at what are the social determinants of health that are important to our community to age and how we can foster it to be a more inclusive uh, age-wise community. And it's not a layout of funds. What it really is, it's a lens and perspective for making decisions. So if you were gonna be building a park, for instance, and you're gonna be installing benches, it would simply be that you'd be thinking that these benches would also have elbow rest so people could push off to get up. And then if you're installing three or four of them, you might put one in a quiet area for somebody with dementia. So we're not talking about a capital expenditure. We're really talking about a philosophy of embedding that uh, sort of caretaking within the decisions that the town makes. So, so that's the first one. Um, secondly, I think that I would really love to uh, highlight our efforts around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think that I, I, I I believe I mentioned this the last time, but really from the day that I've arrived, uh, the town manager has been really clear with me that he wanted to see a more inclusive senior center and has been a real supporter with me in terms of recruiting people, both for the Council on Aging and in terms of any ability that we had to recruit staff that reflected our community more dynamically. So within our Council on Aging, we now have four out of nine persons who represent the BIPOC community. And, and that's tremendous. And the other piece is that while I wasn't able to bring in full-time staff just because of our staffing patterns and, and folks are, are remaining because they like working here, but I was able to apply for and get some full-time grants. And all of the individuals who filled those positions were uh, BIPOC individuals. So we had persons who didn't speak English. They represented a variety of cultures within the community. And it really has brought a, a real air of inclusivity and also uh, welcome within the senior center. And we had folks who were able to speak Spanish to our Spanish speaking uh, clients who come here. We also, um, for the first time, we are hosting a master's in social work student. And so, you know, having the ability to flex uh, the identities of the people that comprise the senior center, I think makes it more appropriate for a community center setting. So, uh, and while numbers alone uh, represent simply a representation and diversity and aren't necessarily a measure fully of what we wanna do, it is in fact a start. So the piece that we're really looking at for the future is within diversity, equity, inclusion is looking at how do we measure inclusion? And that's been something that I think a lot of researchers have been looking at. How do you make sure and gather the experience experiences that make somebody feel either included or excluded. So going forward, one of the most wonderful things, last time I came here, I thanked you for remodeling the senior center. And what I'd like to say this year is that we have this wonderful blank canvas upon which we are going to carefully and thoughtfully reopen and scale up in a way that makes us feel like a different place, a place that is multicultural, a place that is inviting, that the artwork, that the values are displayed in a way that doesn't signal and flag white space. So, so that's where we're going in the immediate future. And then lastly, I think that um, I, I would like to just share with you our scaling up plans to reopen because I know that, that you probably are getting uh, questions about that. 
And we have really are guided, of course, always by the science and the safety that has been promulgated, not only from CDC and the state, but also the Massachusetts Council on Aging. Um, and there are a number of sector specific guidelines which will allow us to, to scale up, but to really scale up in a way that is safe and it will be gradual. And that's gonna be the next message that I'll be sharing with our senior community, because I think that some folks might think when we reopen, it will be back to the way it was, and that won't be immediately possible. I think in the summer months, uh, the, you know, the guidelines around having classes is we have to have people stay outside. They're gonna be admitted 10 minutes before before a class begins, they can't gather in the hallway, they can't gather in the lobby ways. Um, then we are required to have 30 minutes at least between each class to allow for cleaning uh, and for airing out of rooms. So we'll be gathering those um, sort of guidelines and making sure that we're offering socialization and also exercise because we do know that we've experienced cognitive decline and physical decline. So we're preparing and speaking with teachers. Um, but I think underlying everything, what, what I want you to know is we can set out services and programs, but we have to simultaneously work with sort of the psychosocial aspect of what it has done to people to isolate and shelter for a year. Because even in the conversations as people express enthusiasm, they are expressing grave anxiety. And it's almost like a re-entry program. So we're bringing in some experts, Dr. Starr, who's a gerontologist, and also our friends over at UMass who do gerontological psychology and be doing some programs that we'll put on Amherst Media around how do we re-engage and how do you judge what's safe and appropriate. So I think you'll see a twin track of trying to support people emotionally and also adding in the programs and seeing what happens. And then to end on a high note in the intro, we are almost at 90% for vaccination rates for individuals 65 and above, and about 83% for those 75 and above. So I just want to do a huge shout out to everybody in town, from the town manager, his staff, the COVID ambassadors, the health director, Emma Dragon, uh, my own staff, I have to tell you, they were up 24 seven doing, we did, they did over 2000 appointments, waking up at midnight, setting their alarms. Um, we, we looked for any possible open lanes. I know Robert's on here. I read his, his editorial. Uh, we lived it, all of the points that, that he brought out about how, uh, how crazy the, the state and really heedlessly they, they rolled things out, but we were able to find workarounds with everybody, a, a huge team effort. So I think our seniors are looking healthy and we're looking forward to serving them in greater capacity. Well, thank you. It has been a difficult year and uh, Senior Center has certainly been doing your part to try and make it work for our for the population that you serve and I know you've made contributions personally also to other parts and like our homeless population so I appreciate all you've been doing and uh, I'm going to turn in a second see if there are questions from other people in the committee I uh, shared with Sean yesterday that I had uh, been assigned the responsibility um, is the member assigned to community service programs and went over the budget and um, uh, for the sections that we were going to be talking about. And I had one observation and you sort of touched on it actually in something that you said um, uh, in your remarks about your success in obtaining a grant um, that would allow you to bring some additional people in uh, for um, helping out. And um, one of the things that uh, has always been evident to me in reviewing the senior center budget is that um, we have a small staff that does an awful lot. And it does an awful lot because it's able to grab hold of money that's not town money, but money from other sources. And uh, that uh, the way the budget is presented in the current uh, budget book, while I have really appreciated changes, the one thing that I missed was is that uh, I thought that the uh, 
nature of and size of the grants and the outside funding that we receive both from state services from Holland Valley Elder Services and just grants and donations is not as evident in this budget format as it was in prior budget formats. And that the grants are actually listed, you know, substantially later in a separate section of the book just as part of the grant listings. Uh, so I, I, I recognized that didn't end up being too much of a question other than that I thought that uh, the listing of the grants um, was actually omitted donations, which was also another major part of the work because we have the Friends of the Senior Center. And I just didn't feel that we had full picture of what the funding is that supports the work, a lot of it because um, Senior Center and the Council on Aging got and uh, work hard to make it happen. So um, just wanted to share those thoughts with the committee since I had uh, sent it to Sean after, the, after I had reviewed the budget. Yeah, and Andy, just following up on that, that's definitely something we can build back in. Um, you know, we don't do it for all departments, but I think your point is that it's it's such a you know sort of an oversized um, part of what the senior center where their funds come from that it, it you need that to see the whole picture. So that's definitely something we can add back um, going forward. So, questions from other members of the committee or comments, uh, Bob. Yeah, um, I just wanted to, to uh, agree with Sean and, and you, Andy. I think it's important for um, not only the people, the members of this committee, but the people of the town to understand where the money comes from for the senior center and have it all in one place so it's easy to see, uh, especially since it is sort of a diverse set of, of, of funding sources. Kathy? I, I just wanted to say thank you to Mary Beth. Um, what you, both what your lead in to talk about uh, where, where we are um, and demographics and also the work. When I, I look at what with your staff you've been doing, um, she, she grabbed me and my mom when my, she was still alive watching my mother vote because a, a 98 year old was or 99 year old actually was tottering into to vote on uh, to take a picture um but um just so a comment on the healthy aging you're probably already connecting to people but the new york academy of medicine in new york has been doing a healthy aging project for quite some while time they had a lot of um, geriatricians working with them and one of the things they were doing is they were doing a lot of work in libraries when they were in the middle of the day doing book clubs and other things to get seniors out of their house I mean so it was particularly targeted and with what you talked about benches going around doing looking at every bench and whether it has something you could get up and it it has made in a big city like New York, a huge difference because even pre-COVID people were often very isolated. Um, they, especially if they didn't have transportation. So just trying to think of the resources we have and to the extent our little North Amherst library up here does get expanded, which is the plan. Um, and there'll be space for that up here. And I met several very isolated people over time whose elder kids had moved out of town and were looking for some ability to join join in. So I really think what you're doing is fabulous. Thank you. Thanks. Bernie? Yeah, as the, uh, the old, both, both literally and figuratively human services person, um, I, I welcome the, the, the age-friendly designation. And I, I can recall a couple of years ago, having a conversation with, with Dave Stevens, and he was asking me, uh, where's Amherst on this? So now we know Amherst is, Amherst is in, so thank you. Um, to follow up on one of Kathy's observations, though, I'm concerned about our ability to do outreach to elders who are, are homebound or isolated and our ability to address programs. Uh, one of the things I, I ran into and was managing Deerfield frequently was the question of hoarding um, and a question of, of being able to assist people um, doing small tasks. 
uh, changing the light bulbs, mowing the grass. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what um, you and your staff may be capable of or where you're gonna need some help in doing that kind of outreach. Yeah, I think that uh, as we start to reopen a bit more, we have a tremendous volunteer base. We have over 180 volunteers when we are fully operational. So those folks do a lot of that kind of work of you know, assisting somebody. A lot of times it has to do with technology. They can't get their TV to work or a clicker to work. We also partner extensively with Amherst Neighbors. So that's also one of my objectives. And you know, they have already started some of their contactless services. And we speak nearly daily in terms of referrals of folks who might need someone to go for a walk with them or someone who just wants to have a visit on a porch as well. So they have about 160 members right now and they're trying to grow that base and really partner with us because you, know, you need a fleet of people out there doing this kind of work. And when you speak as to the most vulnerable people, quite, quite honestly, most of the most vulnerable people we serve in some capacity through either social services and also through our meal service. So by that, I mean the hot meals, meals on wheels, and also we have a free to go lunch. And you know, we claim a lot of people through that program and certainly our most frail and vulnerable are those individuals who are on that program. They've been identified by a variety of social service providers and we see them every day. And I have to say, even as that program uh, maybe doesn't draw as many people for a congregate setting here in Amherst as other communities, the value to us of the daily contact with people who are our most frail and vulnerable and being able to know when people are in and out of the hospital and what they might need, they're discharged at 5 p.m. on a Friday and I know they're not gonna have food, you know, it, it, it's incredible. So, so those are some of the ways and it's certainly not that we have the, the ability that we're mapping everyone and we're meeting everyone's needs. Um, the more that we let people know that we're here, that we're available, I work with you, one of the, when you mentioned working with homeless, one of the wonderful things about COVID, the upside is that I've been able to work in a variety of roles, either whether it's been food insecurity, working with the chamber and the Latina families, we've worked with 20 of them per month. Um, we've been able to build some deeper networks and also trusting relationships so that when people of any age, quite frankly, when they need help, they come here to the bank center. I mean, we, we had that yesterday where a young family is living in a hotel uh, and they have children and they came here looking for some help. Um, so, so I think that the more we're out there, the more it spreads our name and our good works. So I think it's, it's also about consistency and persistence and being willing to be flexible. We've done mobile office hours. So I think Again, we're always looking to redesign and to be flexible um, and not just in a center. So yeah, I hope that, that helps. It does, thank you. Yeah. Dorothy. Um, this is a question for Mary Beth, mm -hmm. um, picking a, up from a topic you've sp spoken on. Um, <clears throat> when I drove by the green today, I noticed um, <clears throat> there seemed to be a lot of picnic tables and chairs out. And using myself as a case in point, I've got terrible balance and I can't get in and out of some of those things very easily. And so I thought, you know, when we're choosing furniture for a park, um, maybe we should consult you because there are some table chair sets which would be much better for older people or people with lousy balance than others. Um, and uh, that, that, you know, so it's not just price, it really is design. It's design that matters. Um, so I'm just wondering if you've actually thought of those table and chair designs or whether you have any outside your center that seem yeah. to work. So we don't have any in our immediate area in our patio area because it just doesn't facilitate it. But in the nearby um, Boltwood area, they do bring picnic tables that get dropped. And I think that they were primarily for the restaurants. And I, they're, they are, are different in design than the ones you're referring to. Because I was just walking the green yesterday when I noticed those as well. So I do think that your point is well taken and is the precise reason why age-friendly, dementia-friendly matters and can make a small impact that actually makes a difference in quality of life. So yes, and the, the ones that I believe 
have been in the immediate area of the senior center are ones in which they have, um, th there's a, a free entry. So there's nothing that sort of binds up between the leg and the table. So folks can, because a lots of seniors sit at them, quite frankly. Um, yeah, when they get there to go lunch, then they go and they sit at the picnic tables. So. Well, well thank you. Mm -hmm. Kathy, your hand is up. Forgot it to take it down. I didn't think, yeah, taking it, lowering it. Okay. Um, I guess since we've been talking about uh, American Recovery Act and uh, with other parts of the budget, this may be a question for Sean as much as anyone, but uh, some of the extraordinary expenses we've incurred in trying to uh, serve seniors in this very difficult time where we're doing a lot of homebound delivery of meals because we can't have congregate meals in the way that we used to um, gets to additional expense. And if we've been able to tap into any of those funds to help offset those expenses. Yeah, not from the um, not from the American Rescue Plan, but from CARES. Um, when if we've had a, additional expenses, um, those have been charged to CARES. So I believe there have been some additional expenses for um, delivery of food is one area where we redirected some staffing to, to deliver meals. Um, I've worked with Mary Beth on sort of the meal uh, program that we did in December where we provided meals to need, uh, needy families. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head if there were any other additional expenses, but um, anything additional we can cover out of CARES. It just has to be unbudgeted um, and related to COVID. Mary Beth, do you remember any other um, yeah, so, COVID? So we also purchased uh, like small tables for all of our consumers to have outside of their home because mm -hmm. it became a real problem that you have to do a contactless delivery. Uh, so you, you can't hand off because your arm's not going to be long enough and you can't right. put a meal down on the ground because someone can't reach down there. They're going to topple over and it's, it's just it's inhumane, frankly, to put food on the ground for somebody. Um, and so we bought plastic tables for all of our consumers. And I will say that I, I was able, that I tapped into a dislocated restaurant workers grant and that's how I got four of our drivers. And then the town manager helped and uh, allowed a whole host of staff to be reassigned and, and helped us out who were, whose uh, main positions or jobs from LSSE and also the parking management enforcement uh, individuals they had less to do. So they helped us every day with lunches, so. Is there, is there a problem now as we're moving back into uh, actually having people park and pay in parking meters, uh, getting our home deliveries done? No, because the, my, my other uh, sort of carrot to get people to deliver meals, honestly, is the tax work off program. So I have individuals who participate in that. And, um, you know, so as, as different groups have sort of peeled off, we've always been able to find folks who are willing to do it. Uh, it's, it's incredibly socially rewarding, both for the person who delivers and the recipient. We really always look for a bi-directional exchange. Um, and our seniors who are participating in that, you know, they're, they're earning $1,500 off of their real estate tax bill, which is significant for seniors. Um, and also, you know, it's a very safe, contained and controlled opportunity for them to socialize and to meet 12 to 14 people on a given afternoon and, and exchange conversation at the doorstep. So we haven't, we don't, haven't had a problem continuing the program, luckily. It has expanded, certainly, but, um, you know, we, we've really, we've been fortunate. Okay. Um. Other questions from members of the committee? Yeah, I guess my last question is as you look forward to the year ahead and, is, and your plans for getting the center reopened and um, shifting programs back, because um, do, you, are, do you have any concerns about um, whether there's the resources available to support you going forward with the steps that need to be taken? No, 
I think it's less a question of resources and more the way in which our small footprint impedes gatherings that are uh, the typical size that we previously had. So we would have a class of 20 to 25, but now probably the, the largest room will be able to access, the clinic will have to close down. So after that, we'd have the large activity room, which we could fit approximately 15 people in. And so the, um, the other rooms are much smaller you know, and some of them will only allow say six people, sometimes four to five. So the capacity, as long as there's social distancing in order or in effect, will limit our ability to facilitate programming. Um, at the same time, I think that it, to me, it's also a benefit because I think the early adopters who come will be able to help facilitate conversations with people who are more anxious. And by August, sort of a, a groundswell will start to build, I'm hoping, around people coming here, experiencing that it is safe, that we have lots of safety procedures in, in order, uh, and it feels orderly, um, and it's a cautious way to proceed. And then as the restrictions lift in August, I think it will come together nicely, both socially and emotionally, and also our capacity to, to serve programs. So most of our programming is done, it's, it's through volunteers, quite honestly. It's, you know, we're a real volunteer-based uh, organization. and um, so I, I, I don't think it's a question of, of resources. I think it's more just gonna be the question of space and space will open up as time goes on. Has the RSVP program been up and running in full force? Uh, well, and it, yeah, it's up and running, but our RSVP volunteers have not, um, have, have, have not volunteered during COVID and they have not yet returned. And I will say that that's, you know, there's another piece to this that, um, I have found the difference between uh, anticipation versus the reality. So lots of folks have been calling me for months saying, when are you gonna open? And then when I reached out to teachers and volunteers, um, the fact that they're gonna be working with individuals who are not vaccinated had a very chilling effect and on their willingness to return. And I think we're seeing probably up to about 50% of, of volunteers being willing to teach and then also to return. So again, you know, it's, it's going to be a, an incremental resumption, I, I think, based on the fact that there's not a guarantee that they're going into a space with all vaccinated people because we were, they were so very vulnerable. Again, you know, the messaging was so strict for older adults and to sort of expect that they can suddenly take that off and um, get together with groups of people who are unvaccinated you know, it is, um, I think it's going to take time before we're ready to make that kind of cultural shift. Yeah, well, I appreciate all that you've been doing in this very tough year because uh, you just touched on the question of the vulnerability of the population, but uh, also the concern about um, there being historically vulnerable to isolation, which is one of the things that the senior center is about. And uh, so you've had some extraordinary challenges and appreciate you working, keeping after it. Um, any other questions from the committee? Otherwise, uh, I think we can uh, sort of conclude because I think we really understand the budget and appreciate what it's going for. Anything else from the committee? Looking for hands. Seeing none. Okay, well, Mary Beth, thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. And thank you all. Yep. Have a wonderful weekend and especially to Jane. Happy Mother's Day. I love seeing her swing the baby over her own oh, <laughs> memories. Mother four. So take good care. Good luck with thank all your decisions. Thank you very much, Mary Beth. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Bye bye. Okay. Um, so concluding comments about today we're unfortunately the um do we have anything doesn't look like the senior center is represented that uh, uh you mean you mean veteran services um I'm yeah sorry, services yeah i mean you, if you want we can try to schedule it later i mean paul and i can probably talk about it a little bit if you want to try to do today um or we can try to wait and get steve um connor at a future meeting
do uh were there any questions that people feel that they need steve here for um i had my only comment was this and again it's in budget presentation in part um the um uh, budget for the senior for, for excuse me for veterans um also includes a substantial portion of it is the, the benefits mm -hmm. of which we um are responsible for paying the benefits and then get reimbursed 75 percent and that comes in after the fact but yeah uh, yeah so the so the operating budget of 280 that's comp the two big pieces in there are the benefits that are paid out and then our assessment um to be part of the group with Ham uh, other members of hampshire county and then uh and, and the, the benefits, benefits, yeah, the benefits paid out is the full amount. Um, it's not just the town because because we get reimbursed after the fact. So it's the full amount of benefits we pay out, and then the seventy five percent reimbursement comes in on the revenue side of the budget. So, and you can see that on the service levels a little bit if you look at the the service levels. It's not exactly seventy five percent because there's some things that are reimbursed at a different percentage. Um, according to uh, Steve kind of walked us through this when we did our department meeting with him. So there's a little bit of a, a difference. It's not always that percentage, but, um, but there's roughly a, a one year lag or so. Can Sorry. I add a couple other things, Andy, real quick that Steve had mentioned to us in, in the hearing that we had with him? Yes. Um, so just a couple other brief things, uh, similar to um, some of the issues Mary Beth um, had identified. I think Steve uh, in the Veterans Services probably has some of the same challenges, um, not being able to pull people together um, for events the same way that they have done in the past. Um, so he had noted that a, you know, a high priority for him is outreach and um, trying to engage people in different ways. Um, and that's what he's been trying to do. I think he said, you know, we are seeing numbers drop a little bit in Amherst in terms of the number of um, veterans that are claiming benefits so again he's doing a lot of work around outreach to make sure that they're not missing anybody and that everybody who's eligible for benefits can get it um and if i think you know i'll just point you to his he, he wrote a lot for the um accomplishments the things they've been working on um so i'll let that kind of speak for itself and if there are any follow-up questions for steve we can certainly get those to him um, or try to get him back at a future meeting Okay. Any questions or comments of, uh, from the committee about veteran services or things you'd like to know and would pose through Sean? Okay, I think that people are comfortable with that. So um, we will, uh, we're pretty much at, um, at the end of the agenda for today, except for I want to get back to Lynn's question which is what it is that we're reporting to the, uh, the council in our interim reports. And my suggestion is that um, we don't need to repeat what's in the book. What we wanna do is if we've asked questions that we think are important that are additional to the information that was presented, you know, provided through the questions we've, we've obtained information that's additional to what's in the uh, budget as presented. Uh, and that includes for the schools, that that's where we should probably make our focus. And uh, if I, what I would appreciate is um, if you have notes on the sections that you were responsible for in particular, um, or just any notes, but um, really want to focus on the ones that were that are your sections. If you just even put it as a one or two paragraphs and get it to me so that I can um, add it into the uh, report that I have to submit to town meeting or to town to town and I say that to the council would be very helpful. Um, so please do that. Kathy. Andy, can you just resend the schedule for when each thing is? Because somehow I missed that the 20th had been uh, because of the conflict with CRC. I just I don't know where to find the schedule of 
I know when my section, when the police and fire is, but just, yeah. We can resend it, but uh, if, if you want it real fast, it's uh, in the packet for the for the most recent council meeting. Well, I looked for it, and then I don't know what the name of it is. If you don't remember what the most recent packet looked like, <laughs> it's been on for <laughs> it gives you. If I knew what the first three words of it might be, but I tried. Um, so, Andy, yeah. I, I have it right here, so I'll forward it right now. Um, yep. Yeah, I, I knew it was in that packet. I just couldn't find it. Couldn't find it when I went to look. Thanks. Yeah, and I'd love another copy too, Sean. Thank yeah, you. I'll, I'll send out to the full group. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Anything else, Andy? I, in, in in terms of what we write up, I, I I think what we talked about last year is still relevant, and that is kind of pointing out some of the things that may not, you know, they're, they're important for the council to think about and understand. Um, you know, for example, just in the recent discussion of the senior center, I mean, the aging of the town is something we're going to have to deal with, you know, and it's gonna impact a lot of different things. That's a piece of information that you might not get by just reading the budget. So I think that's the kind of information that is very helpful, I think would be helpful to the council and helpful to you know people, the, the people in the town as well to understand these things. So that's good. The the other thing, the yep. other oh, was that me. The other thing we did last year was if something came up that we got information that wasn't already in the budget book that we thought was of broader interest, we made sure to highlight it. It's just we. We got additional report analysis, what whatever it might be that wasn't on page forty-four of the budget book somewhere. Um, okay. And uh, the the other thing I want to say is I'm I'm I've been working through the um, the enterprise funds and the DPW section. And Sean, I'm going to probably have some questions on Monday, around, you know, Monday, uh, I'll send to you. And if anybody else has questions or issues that they've they've uh, seen in that, just uh, let me know, just shoot me an email. Well, thank you. So anything else? If not, then I think that uh, we've completed the agenda for today. Um, if you have, um, sections where you've already been the responsible person and can start working on your section, um, that would be very helpful because we can uh, then include it in the next council report. So with that, I guess I'll declare the meeting adjourned. Thank you.